a man is panting while heavily injured. The people surrounding him contemplate how to treat him. One suggests cutting the spleen and pulling the vein leading to the main injured spot. Our female protagonist contemplates whether to step up and perform the surgery since they have no one else to do it. But in order to do so, she will have to reveal her true identity. Nonetheless, she volunteers, shocking everyone around her. But nothing is more important to her at the moment than saving someone's life. The scene shifts to Earth in the year 2000. The pilot announces abnormal turbulence to all passengers on the flight. Soon, the plane explodes violently as the main engine shuts down. Chaos ensued amongst the passengers, and they cried for help. Among them was Dr. Song. She shudders in fright, not wanting to die after living such a miserable life, and just when she has decided to live happily. As the burning plane flies down, Dr. Song regrets the way she lived her life. Our female protagonist, Song Hyajin, is a surgeon as well as a genius who's chosen to be the youngest lecturer at Seoul University. The nicknames given to her were endless due to her talent. Hundreds of years ago, Hyajin's first life wasn't on Earth, but in a completely different world as Lysade Clorence, the queen of a kingdom. Deemed to have done ill deeds and blinded by envy and greed, she was burned to death. Hyajin still doesn't get why she lived like that. All she wants is to go back in time and at least meet the families that have lost their lives because of her, hoping they will forgive her. She tried so hard to pay for her mistakes in her previous life by saving lives. And then, just as she had achieved her dream and was starting to live happily, she was now about to die. As the plane crashes, Hyajin refuses to die, determined to live the life she wants. Suddenly, all turns dark. Once Hyajin regains consciousness, she finds herself unharmed and alive. She looks around to find herself in a familiar room. There is a sudden knock on the door, and someone addresses her as Milady. She looks in a nearby mirror to realize she is now Lisa de Clorence. In Hyagen's first life, Lisa de Clorence was evil yet blessed with a doll-like face. She would always get mad at nothing, have tantrums, and throw things at people. Many of the servants got hurt because of her behavior. She was basically a witch. But now that she's docile, the maids have noticed this. Though she hasn't committed any crimes yet, she recalls what will happen in the future. She recalls the mental image of her father on his knees, begging for mercy for his daughter. She is determined not to let it happen this time. It's been 10 days since she first woke up here. Though she was in a panic at first, now she has adjusted as Lisa. Although she's not sure what she should do here since she was a surgeon back on Earth, one thing is for sure, she will now live as Lisa de Clorence and won't live her life full of regrets like she did in the past. She got to know that she had been grounded in her room for the past 10 days, for God knows what reason. But today, her confinement period has ended. The maid, Marie, informs Lisa that the Marquess, her father wishes to see her during lunch. Lisa is quite taken aback to realize her whole family will be there. Her father, stepmother, and both her brothers. She is excited to see after facing two lives and deaths. She has been missing them for 30 years. She opens the door to the dining hall. Her shocked face takes her family by surprise. Tears start streaming down her cheeks, worrying the others. Her brother fusses over her, telling his father the punishment was too much. He hugs his sister, telling her to stop crying, as she's an engaged lady now. Lisa mentally asks for her brother's forgiveness, determined not to let the tragic history repeat. Even her mother scolds her father for confining her in her room for 10 days. Her father apologizes, but Lisa was too happy to meet them all to care. She smiles at them, telling them she loves them, shocking them all. Her father begins to grow suspicious after seeing her odd behavior, and he knows something is wrong. Seeing Lisa's changed behavior overnight shocked the servants too. After the family dinner, she directly apologized to all of them for what she once yelled at. Her personal maid, Marie, even notices how she doesn't throw tantrums anymore and even gives gifts to a pregnant maid. This makes Marie wonder whether an angel has taken over the little miss's body. If that's really the case, she hopes it stays and never leaves. One day, Lisa goes to visit her father in his study. She prepares tea for him, and she notices him looking surprised. She asks what's wrong, to which he comments that he never thought he'd drink tea prepared by his own daughter. Lisa's eyes widen at his words, and she recalls her previous life as Song Hyogen. She was ridiculed for being an orphan as a child and isolated despite her academic abilities. Back then, she wanted to be a good daughter but couldn't. Her father's face lit up as he praised the tea for being delicious. Upon asking, she makes up an excuse that she has been practicing. After she leaves, the Marquis notes how much his daughter has changed. He knew this cup of tea was more precious than any treasure. As Lisa gets back to her work, she recalls how she has 10 years until the prince sentences her to death. 
and so she has to be prepared for every important event that will happen in the future. She notes down on a book how her brother dies in the second Krim expedition and a disease takes her stepmother. Further, there's the Treston family conspiracy, the eradication of the Clorence family and the execution of her father and her older brother for protecting the Empress. All members of the first Krim expedition died from an unknown epidemic, killing thousands. Duchess Whale Harbor dies from Parkinson's disease, and the current emperor dies from a chronic illness. After the war, smallpox spreads from the east, and three southern cities are closed. In total, 70,000 people were killed. Since this is an older era, Lisa notes how many diseases are related to incidents since they have yet to establish a public health care system or apply advanced medical procedures. She wonders whether she will be able to use her medical knowledge to help these victims. She decides to discuss this with her father later. She comes across another issue, for which she drops her quill. The prince and Lisa announce their engagement in the year 283 during the royal birthday celebration. She knows only two months are left for it. That's when everything goes downhill. Her family notices how down her mood is and inquire. When she brings up the engagement announcement, Len interjects saying he doesn't see his cider fit to become an empress. This enraged the Marquis but Len asserts his opinion. But to Chris's surprise, Lisa doesn't react like usual. Rather, she smiles, knowing her brother is right and hopes to end the engagement soon. Len soon leaves after that, returning to Nightage. Knowing there's no other way around, Lisa decides to talk to the emperor directly and face the problem head on. The day for her to have an audience with the Emperor finally arrives. She decides to dress modestly, but it is quite difficult considering all she has are flashy dresses. Back on Earth, she refused anything flashy since she was so busy becoming a surgeon. She is the most comfortable in a white coat, but she can't go see the Emperor wearing doctor's attire. She ponders and finally makes up her mind. She even puts on less makeup than usual, to Marie's surprise. But Marie is shocked to see her lady look so sophisticated and pretty and decides that this style suits Lisa better. Her father approaches her but is also shocked to see his daughter. They soon travel to the Imperial Palace. For Lisa, it has indeed been a long time. During the six years she spent here as the Empress, she thought the palace was her whole world. Despite her nervousness, she knows she has to do this, even if her father and the Emperor get angry. She has to end her ties with the prince, no matter what. If she does everything right, she can live as a doctor in this world too. She and her father visit the Emperor in the Rose Garden. As they exchange greetings, Lisa recalls how kind the Emperor has always been. When she had no one to rely on at the palace, his kid words always cheered her up. On his deathbed, he left the empire in her hands. But in the end, she couldn't fulfill his dying wish. And today she is here to ask for something completely uncalled for. She could see how the emperor was trying to hide his sickness. She recalls how the royal doctors said he suffered from bad blood circulation. But there was no clear diagnosis. Recalling his coma, she deduces his symptoms to be fatigued. She begins to figure out what it is, hoping to prevent the political uproar caused by the third prince when the emperor collapses. She gets cut off from her thoughts as the emperor points out how unusually mature she looks today. Her father agrees, telling his majesty how much his daughter has changed over the past few days. He continues telling praiseworthy stories of Lisa to the emperor, piquing his curiosity, and he asks her to brew him some tea too. She obliges and makes tea for him using his favorite tea leaves. The emperor smiles at the delicious taste and requests that she visit her more often to brew this tea. And in return, he promises to gift her anything she wants. Using this opportunity, she begins to express her desire to break ties with the prince. But before she can utter a word, she gets cut off by the arrival of the prince. Her heart pounds loudly as she hears his voice, Prince Leonard. She respectfully greets him, but he stares at her for a moment before turning away without a single word. She used to like his cold gaze a lot, his beautiful face and curt manner, but her love was unrequited. In the past, Lisa tried ample times to mend their relationship but was always received coldly by Leonard. But now, her heart doesn't flutter like it used to, probably because it has been 30 years. As the three men began to talk about launching the Romanov Second Squad to conquer the Krim Peninsula and fighting against the Francoian Empire for it, Lisa recalled how the expedition would ultimately fail, and it's the war that took Chris' life. The king gains her attention, asking her thoughts on the expedition. Despite her initial hesitation, she speaks up, saying there are two things to be wary about in the war. The first is to be wary of the Monsell Kingdom in the East joining the war. Though they have no reason to take part in the war in terms of geopolitics, Lisa explains how the current king there is Count Agrant. Count Ingrid is yet to be acknowledged as a king and needs the support of the Republic in order to be recognized. Her father and the Emperor are taken aback. 
Lisa continues, saying that the Monsell Kingdom was once part of the Francoin Empire. Since the Francoin Republic can't move their forces, they may seek the Count's help to ambush their empire's men for their own advantage. Silence surrounds them. The king grins and acknowledges Lisa's opinion. On the other hand, Leonard says that the Monsell Kingdom can only send about 20,000 men at most to the peninsula, which isn't enough to defeat their men. Lisa agrees but says they will only win if they fight face to face, but there is a possibility for this not to occur. She explains that if the Monsell Kingdom decides to strike, they will march not toward the peninsula but toward the Ukra Mountains by crossing the Donov River. The Ukra Mountains are the only entrance to the Krim Peninsula from the Romanov region in the west. If they take that route, their men will be isolated without any supplies. And if that happens, there is only one outcome, complete annihilation of the expedition. The Emperor realizes her opinion is in fact true and orders a maid to notify the Chancellor that they will discuss this matter with the General tomorrow and decides to be prepared for this circumstance. But what he is curious about is how Lisa came up with this. It's like she's a genius strategist. He praises the Marquess for raising such an amazing daughter. He then asks what's the second thing to be wary of, like she mentioned. Lisa reveals that would be a disease since the peninsula is hot and humid unlike theirs, so they must be wary of all contagious diseases. She suggests that the men have plenty of medical supplies and maintain proper hygiene. Though Lisa knows she is speaking too much, she cares about her brother's and other people's well-being. The emperor appreciates her advice and decides to bestow her with the Britia insignia of honor if her suggestions help their expedition. This surprises Lisa, also called the Cross of Royalty. It is an insignia that bears the highest power and acknowledgement in the empire. For a noble of the empire, it is indeed the greatest honor. Later, she presents the gift she brought for the emperor. It is a rare incense from the nation of Chunk. She explains how it's a candle used by the nobles of the kings and how she heard that the rich and refreshing scent helps liven up one's spirits. The emperor thanks her, saying he indeed is feeling exhausted and fatigued. Lisa's eyes widen. She asks him a bunch of questions and realizes what she doubted was in fact true. The great emperor of Britia was indeed never diagnosed properly, which is why he fell into a coma, eventually dying from such a simple disease. He has diabetes mellitus. His blood sugar kept rising because he wasn't treated, and he suffered from acidosis when his blood sugar hit 1,000. If he were at this stage, Lisa knows the current medical knowledge of Britia wouldn't be able to diagnose or cure him. Lisa speaks up, telling the emperor how she read about a disease with similar symptoms as his recently. She reveals how these symptoms arise when there is too much sugar in the blood. The matter concerning the emperor's diseases is solved as the king decides to talk to Baron Sven, who is an excellent doctor. Now all that's left is Lisa's engagement to the prince. She bluntly asks the emperor to reconsider the engagement, shocking them all. She gets to her knees, begging for the emperor's forgiveness and revealing how she became greedy for the crown in the past but now she sees her flaws and wants to step down for the honor of the Britia Empire. However, her plans are spoiled as the Emperor takes her words affirmatively. He is glad that she recognizes her flaws but acknowledges her being fit for the responsibility. He asks her age, which she reveals to be 16. He then motivates her and praises her for being worthy of the throne. But this isn't what Lisa wanted. She decides to be honest, and she reveals another reason for canceling the engagement. She then reveals that she wants to be a doctor. She really does want to live her life as a doctor, the metal scalpel, the power of a heartbeat, and the happiness felt from saving a life. The king ponders for a while and then makes a bet with Lisa, before acknowledging that he might be at a disadvantage. Lisa convinces him that it's a path that is worth the sacrifices and explains how her interest peaked as she read medical books. He tests her more, and lastly, he asks if she thinks she can become a doctor. He explains how, in order to be recognized as a doctor, she must pass the test held by the medical council, and even if she's a noble of great influence, no special treatment will be given for the exam. A doctor is one of the most honorable professions in the empire, next to lawyer and administrator. Just like on earth, doctors are highly respected, and the competition to become one is fierce. This wasn't always the case, but 100 years ago, theories on advanced medical practices became widespread. And now, the entire continent is aware of the importance of public health. Many nobles wish to become doctors, yet one must be at least a rich citizen to become one. She firmly replies in the affirmative, saying she wishes to become someone who can save lives. The emperor hums in agreement and asks if she knows that if he orders her to marry the prince, she must follow regardless of her wishes. Lisa says she does, but the emperor reveals he doesn't want to force her and decides to give her time to prove her worth as a doctor. 
If she accomplishes something that is more valuable than becoming the future empress, he vows to leave her to do as she wishes without a second word. This is his offer and bet. If she fails, he tells her she has to follow his wishes. She has time until she becomes an adult, meaning she has to prove her worth within six months. Lisa bows in respect and agrees to his wishes. The emperor is surprised by her determination but is certain she will give up eventually since the burden is too much. They continue chatting, but it then suddenly occurs to the emperor that he should leave the young ones alone. He suggests the prince take a walk around the garden with Lisa, and Leonard obliges. She takes his hand and follows him away awkwardly. Though she doesn't hold a grudge against him for executing her, she finds the situation uncomfortable. In fact, he is the victim. Being forced to marry her made him unhappy. Leonard speaks up, asking if there is something she wants to tell him, as he can tell some things on her mind. She remarks that she is just thinking about the past. Leonard halts and is taken aback as Lisa bows and apologizes sincerely for everything. She smiles, saying she has pestered him since they were young, and he is being forced to marry her. He asks, who said he was forced into this engagement? Meanwhile, the Marquess informs the Emperor of Marquess Child's suspicious activities with Prince Michael. He decides to continue spying on them. The Marquis then apologizes for her daughter's behavior, but the king says there's nothing to apologize for. He confesses how surprised he is to expect such a big aim from a sheltered child like Lisa. He recalls how her mother, Teresa, also put her family in shock when she announced to the whole world that she would become a nurse. The emperor tells him to have Lisa learn from House Clarence Hospital and Teresa Hospital. On the other hand, Lisa is taken aback by Leonard's inquiry. She says his dislike is obvious towards her and promises to ensure the engagement gets cancelled. Leonard frowns and turns away. Lisa is certain this time will be different, hoping they both find their own happiness. She gives her blessings to Leonard, the one she truly loved in the past. Hearing about Lisa's ambitions caused her family immense surprise. They didn't take her seriously, knowing it wouldn't last long, but they decided to support her in their own way. She convinces Chris to take her to the Britia Library on his way to work. She has made up her mind to buy as many medical books as she can until she starts working at the hospital in a few weeks. She needs to know how advanced the medical field is in this empire to provide the right diagnosis and treatment. And so, the next day, Lisa notes how the empire's medical knowledge is more advanced than she thought. Especially in the field of pharmaceuticals, they already have antibiotics and anesthetics. X-rays are possible, along with basic chemical examinations. Plus, they know how to use anesthetics for surgery. Lisa is aware that the empire's medical development is all thanks to one person. That is the great alchemist, Fleming. She wonders if Fleming used to live on Earth just like her. If Fleming had, he would have received the Nobel Prize over 20 times. Still, the Empire lacks a basic understanding of illnesses. She scribbles down several cures for various illnesses until night approaches. Her brother is shocked to learn Lisa is still at the library. It is reported that she is studying hard and won't even budge to eat. Chris quickly makes his way to the library and to his sister. He notices the books and notes she has been reading and taking. He contemplates whether his sister has been studying medicine in secret or is really a genius. He casts his thoughts aside and says they should go back. But to his surprise, Lisa insists they stay for a bit more. A few days passed by, and Chris informed their father that Lisa was going to the library every day and staying late. On the other hand, her father is also concerned. His daughter hasn't always been a healthy child and will definitely face discrimination in the medical field. Moreover, she's going to the Teresa Hospital, not the Royal Cross. Teresa Hospital is a relief center for the poor and operates on funds from their families, but it doesn't have the best facilities. He is certain Lisa will surely face hardship. He asks his daughter if she is overexerting herself just for the sake of not marrying the prince. If that's the case, he assures her that he will talk to the emperor about it. Lisa sincerely assures her father she is doing all this for the right reasons, making her father calm down a little. He then informs her that she will be going to the hospital in two days, and her patron will be Viscount Kate. Plus, her true identity will be hidden, as she asked, saying she won't be taught properly otherwise. Two days later, on May 28th of the year 283, the day that will later be recorded in medical history has arrived. This is the day Lisa first arrived at the hospital. Graham Fallen was the eldest son of a fallen baron. He is a genius doctor and the youngest professor at Teresa Hospital. He is pissed that he has to teach a 16-year-old noble at Dr. Play. Lisa arrives at the exact time and introduces herself as Rose. Graham finds the young girl pretty but is certain she is just like the other typical noble girls. He can tell just by looking at her that she's never done any hard work. He asks how she was educated since her record doesn't show her enrollment in any academy. 
When she reveals she has been studying by herself, he scoffs. He bears with her since her patron is Viscount Kate, the vassal of the Clarence family. Graham then asks if she knows what the art of medicine is, and she responds that it's the art of treating patients. He pauses and asks if she has seen someone die. Lisa looks down and says she has. Graham explains that she will face many different situations while learning medicine, and asks what she will do if a patient dies during the treatment. She firmly affirms that she will bury the patient in her heart. The fact that she even knows what the phrase means shocks Graham. Among doctors, to bury a patient in one's heart means that when a patient is lost due to unforeseen circumstances, the doctor will remember and make sure it never happens again. He concludes that she doesn't know the meaning. Plus, that's not something one can learn unless they directly experience it. But since Viscount Kate recommended her, he has to give her a job, and he is certain she won't last long anyway. He ponders and decides where to put her. Though it will be too cruel for a young girl like her, if she's going to quit, it is best for it to happen as soon as possible. He has her follow him to a room where all the beggars are treated. Graham explains that this is where they take care of those who have no recovery chances. Though there is no need to treat them, they have to take care of them, as that was the last will of Lady Teresa, the former Marchioness of House Clarence. He explains how her job is to take care of the patients here. She asks what exactly she has to do, identify their illnesses or focus on making them more comfortable. Graham tells her to make them comfortable, as there's no cure. He permits her to do as much as she can, but not anything rash. He tells her to let him know if the work is tough, as he doesn't plan on forcing her to do it. Lisa smiles, saying she will do her best. Though Graham admires her determination, he is confident she won't last more than a few days. Meanwhile, Lisa has already figured Graham thinks of her as a nuisance. But one thing he doesn't know is that she is used to homeless patients like these. She has seen worse back on earth and remembers how difficult her first operation was. She hopes to work hard and get a medical license as soon as possible. For that, Lisa has to pass the medical research exam, which one can usually take only after years of work as an apprentice. But she doesn't have that much time. If she is going to win the bet with the emperor, she will have to earn a medical license soon. Determined, she asks the hospital maids to help with the sanitary conditions in the room, which involves bathing the patients and cleaning them. The maids hesitated at first since they were never ordered to do so and so Lisa decides to take matters into her own hands. A while later, the maids decide to do their job after seeing her sincerity toward the patients. After the three had scrubbed hard, the room was cleaner than ever. Now the next step is to treat the patients. The first patient fractured his spine in a fall, but it was too late for treatment. What she can do is help improve his diet and disinfect his bed sores. Lisa ordered the patient to be taken to the operating room and to bring disinfectants, anesthetics, and sterilized knives. She explains how she will be cutting away the dead tissue. And for the blood, they might need many bandages as well. She hopes not to get scolded for this, but Lisa knows that if she leaves the patient like that, his condition will worsen. She needs to treat him before he develops severe blood poisoning also known as septicemia. Lisa explains the procedure to the patient and begins the operation despite the maid's concerns. She turns excited as the scalpel is handed to her. As she treats the patient, she is determined to live her life as a doctor, not an empress. The maids spectate Lisa and are shocked to see such skillfulness with the scalpel, which they haven't seen even within their licensed doctors. The treatment is soon done, and the patient exclaims how he feels better than before. On the other hand, the maids are in a daze, but they agree to help instantly with the next patient's wound with Lisa. A week passed by, and a man asked Graham how the young lady Viscount Kate recommended was faring. This makes Graham realize he hasn't heard from her in a while, and wonder if she quit without telling him. The man scolds Graham for not doing his job properly, and is ordered to check on Lisa. Graham goes to Lisa's ward in annoyance and is surprised to find the place so clean and the people so lively. He then looks at Lisa, nodding off in a corner. He is shocked to find her still here, but before he can wake her up, the patients inform him how she spent the whole night looking after them. They ask him to give her a break. Even the maids sing her praises and reveal everything to Dr. Graham. But Graham was certain the young lady must have made things worse for the patients. He checks on the operation she performed himself, prepared to scold her. On the other hand, Lisa wakes up. She notes how this body is weak. She looks up to see Graham staring at her and asks what she did with the patients. She rises, explaining how she diagnosed their symptoms. He continues scolding her for doing such a dangerous operation and checks on the patient. However, he is shocked to see no sign of pus or discharge, plus his skin is healing well. Graham asks who did this since someone must have helped her. The maids assure him she did it all by herself, but Graham is in no mood to believe her. 
In the meantime, Dr. Sven is unable to figure out what disease the Emperor has caught. Though he apologizes profusely, the Emperor assures him that being a doctor doesn't mean one can cure all diseases. Despite how advanced their medical knowledge has become, some things are still unsolvable. The prince, who stood on the bed's foot, heard them. He then tells Dr. Sven how someone mentioned that similar symptoms appear if there's too much sugar in one's blood. Hearing this, Dr. Sven cracks the code and rises up. He recalls how medical professionals from the Francoin Republic recently published a disease similar to what the prince just mentioned. His majesty indeed has diabetes mellitus. He hastily excuses himself, hurries away to research it, and asks for the renowned doctor who brought forth the diagnosis. He explains how nobody knew of this disease until recently. But even then, only about 20 people know of this. He excuses himself and begins finding out who the esteemed doctor might be since the royals refused to tell him. He shortlists and concludes that the doctor is from Teresa Hospital. On the other hand, the emperor reveals upon asking the prince that he doesn't want Lisa to enter the medical field as she will be Leonard's fiancé soon. They get to business, and Leonard reveals how the second squad is marching towards the crim. Also, an unofficial envoy from the Francoin Republic has recently visited the Monsell Kingdom, and they will likely attempt to ambush their men at a critical moment. The Emperor is shocked and acknowledges that the Empire has been saved by Lisa. He has his son inspect Pierre, as that is where Teresa Hospital is and tells him to go see if Lisa is doing well. On the other hand, Lisa explains to Graham how she learned about the operation procedure in a book. Graham ponders for a while and decides to change her room duty. He then reveals that he will be her teacher starting tomorrow, officially acknowledging her as his apprentice. Internally, he wanted to find out whether she was telling the truth or not. The whole day, he tests her with the diagnoses of different patients. And to his surprise, she guesses them all correctly, like an experienced doctor. But how could such a young girl have experience? At the end of the day, he apologizes for holding prejudices against her and promises to work together from now on. They shake hands, and Lisa leaves for her home. There, her father asks if she's doing fine. Lisa smiles and agrees. But the Marquis was enraged at Teresa Hospital for having her daughter work in a room full of beggars. If it wasn't for Lisa stopping him, he would have fired them all. He wants her to quit, but seeing her look so happy makes him decide against it. The next day, Lisa goes to the critical shelter instead of the hospital, as Graham told her to. The critical shelter is like the emergency room back on Earth. In short, it's a place where patients with serious injuries come in every second. Learning his delicate child is being sent to the critical shelter makes the Marquis furious once again, and Lisa has to calm him down. Seeing a noble lady at such a place shocks the doctors there, but they are more surprised to know that Dr. Graham is her teacher. Graham has one of the fellow doctors' guides, Lisa, and so Hansen helps her tour the shelter. They eventually get interrupted as a critical patient arrives. Seeing how the patient won't survive if they don't hurry, Lisa decides to take matters into her own hands. She asks for the stethoscope and deduces the patient to have pneumothorax, which is the collapsing of the lungs. At this rate, Lisa knows 70% of the patient's lungs will have already collapsed. Moreover, it isn't a simple pneumothorax. Too much air has been released and is putting pressure on his heart, this means he will go into shock. He will die unless he is treated right away. She orders a disinfectant and the thickest needle syringe to be brought. She treats him swiftly and later apologizes, saying it was urgent. Just then, Graham barges in, only to find the patient has already been treated. He gets to know the needle was handled by Lisa, or is known to him by the name Rose. Upon asking why she did this, she revealed that she inserted the needle to release the air. Graham realizes the patient would have died if not treated right away, and thanks Lisa for her help. Hansen notices this, as Graham is famous for never handing out praise. As people surround her with praise, Graham is unable to come up with any suitable explanation for a young lady with no experience to handle such a situation in an emergency. He finally comes to the conclusion that the woman is a true genius, and next to her, his talent seems insignificant. He was born the eldest son of a fallen house and climbed into the position after years of hard work. Graham studied to become even better than renowned doctors and scholars like Count Braham or Fleming. But he knew that he didn't have such talent and that he was simply a hard-working student. Yet she is amazing, even at such a young age. He decides to open a bottle of wine tonight, knowing things will get interesting from now on. A month passed, and gossip about Lisa's talent spread like wildfire. Meanwhile, Hansen begins to like Lisa so much that it seems like torture to him. On the other hand, Leonard and his subordinate, Randall, visit Pierre in full disguise. His subordinate, noticing how hard he's working, asks if he isn't tired since he seems not to sleep well. 
Leonard agrees, but deep down, he knows he has never once slept in peace since that day, 15 years ago. Despite Randall's protest, Leonard refuses to see another doctor and affirms that he will continue taking his medication. Leonard recalls how he has come here solely because his father ordered him to. Though he doesn't care who his fiance is, he admits Lisa does cause him to worry a bit. Before they can return to the palace, they are stopped by a thief. Though Randall tackles the thief and wields his word to throw his dagger away, he gets shot unexpectedly. This shocks both Randall and Leonard. Leonard notices how he has been shot at a critical point. Determined not to let an ally die, he takes Randall to the nearest hospital, Teresa Hospital. There, Graham and Lisa come to inspect Randall. Lisa makes eye contact with Leonard and finds him oddly familiar. Leonard notices she has lost weight, but she looks livelier. Graham reveals that it will be difficult to treat the patient. He explains that the bullet penetrated his spleen, and there are numerous blood vessels in that organ. It is impossible to stop the bleeding there, and there is no way to treat him. Leonard shows him the crest of the royal Romanov family, telling him to do whatever he can to save him. Before Graham can refuse once more, Lisa agrees to do what they can. She tells Graham they can cut the spleen entirely and tie the connecting arteries. Though the procedure is simple, it's a revolutionary idea that hasn't been thought of before. Though Graham finds the idea good, he expresses his concern over how the spleen is located deep within the abdominal cavity, where the rest of the organs are also located. Lisa explained that if the ligament supporting the spleen is cut, the spleen can be rotated. Graham is confused and asks who will perform the surgery since he is incapable of doing what she is saying. To this end, Lisa reveals she will do it, pleading with him to believe in her or he will die. Leonard, who has been hearing this conversation, asks if she really can, and she says she will do her best. Leonard agrees and tells her to save him. But Graham and Lisa needed another person to help them since everyone else was already busy taking care of other patients. Leonard offers to help, revealing he sat through many medical procedures during the Angeli War. He introduces himself as Ron, and they get to work. Lisa knew the operation was a critical one, even for the great surgeon Song Hyogen. Judging from his state, she could tell it was at least a grade 5 spleen injury and could lose him in an instant. She splices the wound open, and Randall begins bleeding excessively. She orders Ron to take the gauze and apply pressure to the area, and she asks Graham to move the stomach and list the lower ribcage. Graham's eyes widen as he sees the spleen. He wonders how Lisa is so swift, it's as if she's done many procedures before. Lisa then begins to cut the spleen and begin the removal procedure. It finally ends successfully. They then close the stomach, dress the wound, and give Randall an IV solution for the blood loss, while Ron is told to wait outside. Later, Lisa assures him that Randall is fine now and will recover with time. Though Leonard is not a medical expert, he could tell the surgery wasn't done on confidence alone. He had thought she was lying just to break off the engagement. He thanks her, and she also thanks him for helping out. He begins to take his leave, but suddenly he feels dizzy. Before he can collapse, Lisa steadies him. She notices his paleness and offers to check his temperature. Leonard's cheeks flushed, and he refused, saying he always suffered from slight dizziness. Chronic dizziness wasn't good. Lizzie asks him to come again if his symptoms continue. The next day, at Royal Cross Hospital, Dr. Sven is shocked. He summons all the doctors of the Royal Cross Hospital and later visits Teresa Hospital in person. He then asks Baron Goth about the doctor who did that surgery, the splenectomy. This shocks the other doctor as well. Dr. Sven shows him the procedure writings, but the Baron isn't phased in the slightest, saying it is impossible. But when Dr. Sven confirms that it is true, he is also shocked and reveals that it is Dr. Graham. But what's odd is that Graham didn't come to the hospital after that day as if shocked by something. It was concerning for Lisa too, and she grew worried as days passed and Graham didn't come. She ultimately visits his house, and the maid reveals how she won't be able to visit him as he's too entranced by his research. The maid reveals that after he was on duty a few days ago, he said he witnessed an amazing surgery. And since then, he has been researching it in his room and hasn't left since. The maid apologizes, saying all Graham has ever wanted to be a doctor after he lost his parents to the Londo epidemic. As she leaves, Graham notices her. He goes to the hospital the next day and leads Lisa to an office, where she sees Dr. Sven and Baron Goff. Dr. Sven recognizes Lisa partially, as he has met her before, but thinks it isn't her, as she wouldn't be a doctor. He begins bombarding Graham with questions on how he performed the surgery, but he tells him to ask the lady, not him. Dr. Sven and Baron Goff were shocked to their cores as they couldn't comprehend such a young girl. And that too, with zero prior experience, came up with such a theory and did the splenectomy. This means only one thing. 
The girl is a genius who surpasses both Count Braham and the great alchemist Fleming. Even Graham swears in his honor that she is telling the truth and says that Rose is the most skilled and knowledgeable doctor he has ever met in his life. He frowns slightly, revealing that though she came here as an assistant, there is nothing for him to teach her as she surpasses his abilities. Now certain that Rose is the mystery doctor, Dr. Sven offers her to join the Royal Cross Hospital. Lisa is surprised, as the Royal's Cross Hospital is the most honorable and best medical center in the Empire. As for the license, Dr. Sven explains that the doctor's exam will be held right after this year's royal birthday celebration. She can take the test and get a license. Baron Goth argues that she also needs recommendations from three professors. Dr. Sven explains that it will be the two and Graham. Moreover, this time the test will be pretty difficult, according to the Emperor's orders. It is a surprise since the Emperor never usually interferes with the doctor's exam. When asked, Lisa agrees to take the opportunity, and Dr. Sven becomes excited, wondering how well she will do on this year's highly difficult exam. Later, Lisa ponders deeply. She knows she won't have much time to study for the exam as the birthday celebration is right around the corner. She recalls how, in her past life, when she was 16, the royal birthday celebration was quite special. A lot happened, but that was when her engagement to the prince was announced. She was ecstatic, not knowing that the engagement would be the beginning of her tragedy. She assures herself that nothing will happen, as the emperor gave her his word, so he won't announce the engagement. But she halts as she remembers that they had already made a notice that the prince's fiancé would be announced during this year's celebration. She decides to stop worrying and gets back to work. On her way back, she bumps into Ron. Leonard, who has come in disguise, stares at her and excuses himself to leave, saying he came here just to see something. But Lisa grabs his hand and tells him to wait. She then says he should get examined because she is always exhausted. And so in the checkup room, Lisa begins examining him, involving a lot of touching that makes Leonard flustered. This makes Leonard wonder whether she does this with other patients as well, bothering him oddly. He has come here unintentionally, as his feet led him here. After some time, Lisa reveals that his exhaustion and tiredness are most likely caused by de Quervain's thyroiditis. She explains that due to inflammation, his thyroid gland isn't functioning well, thus resulting in a hormone imbalance. She explains to him what the thyroid gland is and how the lack of thyroid hormone production is causing him to feel dizzy and exhausted. Leonard is amazed to see how the symptoms Lisa is describing are the ones he has been experiencing for the past two months. She prescribes him some medicine and tells him to come back after three days, as she has to adjust his medicine after checking his recovery. He agrees to visit in three days and leaves. The next day, Baron Goth is called by the Marquis, who asks about Dr. Rose at Teresa Hospital. Baron reveals all the wonderful things Rose has been doing, shocking the Marquis. He is proud that his daughter is following in Teresa's footsteps. Later, the Baron is summoned by the Emperor as well, who inquires about Rose. Despite hearing her praises, the Emperor is certain the praises are exaggerated. Later, as Lisa is treating Leonard, she tells him he is healing remarkably and doesn't need to come anymore, oddly disappointing Leonard. He later comes back to his office and asks for Lenny's advice on what to gift his sister. Lenny says Lisa likes to eat desserts, especially strawberry cake, but not milk. But Leonard tells him to think of a gift, asking what kind of present he would give when confessing his feelings. This makes Lenny flinch, and an awkward silence ensues. Judging by Lenny's character, Leonard doubts he has even touched a woman's hand. But it's not like he's any different. He knows his brother, Michael, will know about such things. But despite him being his brother, Leonard can't forgive him or any of them for what happened that day. Lenny suggests gifting jewels, as Lisa enjoys shiny things. Leonard agrees, deciding to trust her brother's words, though he thinks they don't suit her. However, Lisa doesn't accept his extravagant gift. Leonard, disguised as Ron, apologizes for offering such a thing and says he must somehow repay her for her help, apart from just paying the hospital fees. Lisa ponders and suggests he buy her some strawberry cake if they meet again. She excitedly reveals that the one from Bea Bakery on Pike Street is the best. She whimpers, saying her mother won't let her eat it because she thinks it's bad for her. Leonard named more things Lenny had told him that Lisa liked, making her confused. Leonard smiles at her, promising to ensure she gets to eat plenty of them from now on. As the birthday celebration approached, the preparations made the empire busier. Even the hospital is taking a holiday. While her parents bicker about choosing dresses, Lisa's brother asks if she isn't going to get ready. Lisa replies that she will wear the dress she picked out last time, surprising him. Lisa plans to show her face for a bit and leave right away to study. Seeing how pale she looks, her brother forces Lisa to rest because she's overexerting herself. 
It turns out he is right, as Lisa becomes sick with a fever. That too was on the day of the birthday celebration. A doctor is called, but Lisa already tells him that it seems she has an infection in the upper airways. Her brother and father worry and ask the doctor if she will be alright. Nervous, the doctor assures them it's similar to a cold, and she just needs rest. He leaves some medicine and exits the room. Her father forbids Lisa from going to the hospital since she got sick from working hard. Even her brother agrees. Lisa assures them she won't get sick again and pleads with them using her cute appearance. As expected, the men give in. Despite their hesitation to bring her to the celebration, Lisa says she will just sit quietly and return home the moment the announcements are over. Murmurs surrounded the Clorence family as they headed to the palace. They are in awe of the most beautiful lady in Britia, Lisa Clorence. Soon, her family members are dragged away by other nobles, leaving her alone. She settles herself in a corner to rest. Soon, the royal prince's arrival will be announced. Murmurs fill the hall once again as the prince hates banquets and rarely attends. Moreover, he seems to be looking for someone. Lisa finds Leonard staring at her but knows he isn't, as she is too far away. She hopes for Michael to be here, her only friend from her past life. Fate really can be strange. Leah faced turmoil with those she should have been close to and was friends with the one she should have avoided the most. She gets cut off from her thoughts as Lady Yulian approaches her. House Childa and House Clarence's daughters have been rivals for a long time. The reason is that Yulian always admired the prince, just like her. She sighs, wondering whether it would have been better if Yulian became the empress instead of her. Recalling all the bad things she did to Yulian, Lisa bows in respect and sincerely apologizes to her for her immature behavior. Yulian is shocked and wonders if this is also an act to make fun of her. She remarks that she is acting differently today and shifts the topic, asking if she knows who will be announced as the prince's fiancé today. Lisa says she isn't a candidate. Yulian says that whoever it may be, she is quite jealous. Leah stares at her, realizing she still has feelings for the prince. She is aware of a political difference that separates the prince and Lady Yulian. To Lisa's surprise, Yulian tells her to get well soon and invites her to tea later as well. Meanwhile, Leonard is angry over how all men's attention is caught up by the beautiful Lisa, whom he has been noticing for a while now. He asks Lenny if his sister isn't feeling well. Lenny says he isn't sure, as she's too far away. Seeing Lenny doesn't seem to matter. Leonard decided to go over there himself. But before he can approach Lisa, he finds a man looming towards her. The man praises Lisa and introduces himself as Louis, an envoy from the Francoine Republic. Lisa is taken aback. She recognizes him as Louis Nicholas, the Scorpion of the Desert. He's the only son of the Francoine Republic's president. During their takeover of the northwestern part of the Dark Lands, Lois was the best soldier. He is also the man who came up with the idea of using the Monsell Kingdom to ambush the Krim expedition. And worst of all, in her past life, Chris died because his squad was slaughtered by this man's tactic. Louis remarks that he never imagined the genius strategist who thwarted his plan would be such a beautiful lady. He reaches out his hand, asking for a dance. Knowing there is no way out of this, she takes his hand, still wishing someone would step in. But before they can make it to the dance floor, Leonard stops them and asks Louis to let go. But Louis has no intention to do so. Leonard asks if he's blind, saying the lady is uncomfortable. Louis glares at Lisa and lets go, saying he is a bit forward. He then turns away after asking if it would be alright to ask her for a dance the next time they meet. And Lisa says yes. Lisa then greeted the prince and thanked him, saying she didn't want to dance with him. Leonard then asks her to dance with him, taking her aback. As they dance, people ponder whether he really is the prince. They find the two to be in complete sync and wonder if she will be the one announced today. Lisa recalls how hard she used to work to follow the prince's complicated steps. When she first danced with him, she was humiliated because she couldn't follow his assertive lead. She practiced until her feet bled, just to impress the prince. Regardless, she knows she won't be dancing with him again. Seeing her dissatisfied face, his lead starts becoming more aggressive. As the dance ends, Leonard checks Lisa's fever since she really doesn't look well, gaining the attention of the onlookers. His doubts are right, and he leads her to the royal's lounge, regretting making her dance. Lisa noticed how unusually kind he was to her, unlike the past hatred he held towards her. She musters up the courage to ask him if there's a reason. He is being especially kind to her today. Leonard tells her not to worry, as he just wants to apologize for making her dance like that without knowing her condition. He asks if she is hungry, saying he will have someone bring in some strawberry cake. This surprises Lisa. Leonard asks if she doesn't like it, which she says she does. He leaves, telling her to rest as there's still some time left until speech. She thanks him, to which he says nothing and hopes she feels better soon. 
Lisa is confused, as she had never heard the prince say such words to her in the past when she was sick quite often. Lisa soon begins munching on the delicious confectionaries that taste as delightful as Bea Bakery's cakes. The maid reveals they have a new dessert chef who joined the royal kitchen upon request, a chef who used to work at Bea Bakery on Pike Street. Lisa ponders who made this happen and continues eating. She eventually dozes off. She is later woken up by an old woman, who informs her that the emperor will be giving his speech soon. The woman seemed familiar to Lisa, who recognized her as a prestigious noble from Wales who was a relative of the noble family. She greets Duchess Harbour, who asks her for help walking as her legs are stiff. Lisa diagnoses her freezing gait and walks as Parkinson's. With Parkinson's, the nerve cells gradually disintegrate, resulting in a loss of movement. In her past life, due to the disease, the Duchess choked to death on food she was unable to swallow. Even on Earth, it is not a curable disease but can be delayed. She hopes the Duchess stays safe. Chris soon approaches her, worriedly asking if she's feeling better. Lisa agrees, and they join their father before the Emperor begins his speech. The Emperor soon gives his speech and, at the end, announces that the Prince's fiancé's announcement will be postponed until Lisa is of age. Lisa frowns, realizing that though he didn't go against their bet, he did practically tell everyone she was the Prince's fiancé. The scene shifts to Lisa waking up from a nightmare involving the Prince announcing her execution. She read the news announcing her as the fiancé of the prince. She realizes even her father didn't know about this, judging from his expression yesterday. She decides to speak with the emperor and correct everything before it's too late. She takes a few painkillers and goes out. There, she is approached and congratulated by many people. She tells them all that his majesty has yet to make an official announcement. Duchess Harbour also approaches her, telling her the prince is cute once she gets to know him, surprising Lisa. The Duchess explains that he was quite cute and lovely as a child. She drinks her wine and begins to continue, but suddenly starts choking on it. Lisa could tell it was also because of her disease. She hopes to save her and find time to teach the Duchess how to stay safe. The Duchess then reveals she came to deliver a message, informing her his majesty would like to speak to her. Lisa finds the Emperor and exchanges greetings. The Emperor asks for her to brew the tea she offered him the last time they met, and she obliges. After serving it to him, Lisa asks if the bet that was agreed upon last time is still in effect. Lisa knew she was at a disadvantage despite the bet, but she is determined to win no matter what it takes. The Emperor laughs, saying it is, and won't go back on what he said. He assures her the engagement isn't official and confesses how he wants her to become the Empress badly and be his son's aide. Lisa wonders why he wants her to be the empress that badly. It must be because of her noble status or her strategic achievements from before. But she knew there was something else that she couldn't put a finger on. The emperor suggests cancelling the bet. But they get interrupted as a guard announces the duchess collapse. Lisa was afraid this would happen. And indeed it did. She hurries downstairs and makes her way to the unconscious duchess. She notices how her skin is already turning blue due to the lack of oxygen in her body. She realizes the food from the banquet must have gotten caught in her airway. She decided to perform an emergency procedure, an emergency tracheostomy. She will have to use a knife as a scalpel and pierce a hole in her throat so she can breathe. And that's the only way as she has only about 30 seconds left. She knows she must avoid the thyroid gland, blood vessels, and nerves. The incision can be too high, too low, or too deep. She finally finds the right spot. As the knights rush to her to make her stop, she tells them to halt or she won't be able to help the duchess. She then focuses on piercing the hole and sees the food lodged in her throat. She successfully operates. Murmurs surround her, and she knows she is in trouble as tracheostomy hasn't developed in this world yet. She is taken away, but she tells the knights beforehand to inform the royal doctors to disinfect the duchess' wounds. At the palace, Lisa's father begs his majesty to free his daughter, as she can't harm a royal, and he is sure she is just trying to save the duchess. The emperor stops him and assures him that he knows Lisa is innocent, which is why he has been confined to another castle rather than the prison. He then reveals that the Duchess did survive and is doing much better. The problem is that Lisa harmed a royal with a medical procedure that hasn't been approved yet. The Emperor decides to have the best doctors investigate the matter thoroughly and use any excuse to hold her responsible, so she will quit the hospital. Royals who have committed a crime are confined within the Castle of a Hundred Wishes, though others call it the Bloody Tower. There, Leonard finds Lisa peacefully asleep. He mentally asks who could do something so reckless, and he feels annoyed whenever he sees her. Yet, why is he here again? It's not easy to sneak in here using his metamorphosis powers, and it's difficult enough to avoid the other one here who shares this ability. But he finds her amazing to have performed another successful operation. 
He gets cut off from his thoughts as he sees Lisa cry in her sleep, pleading with someone not to die. He wipes her tears away, wondering what's making him suffer. When he sees her in pain, his chest tightens, and he can't focus on his work. Ever since he saw her working and studying medicine so seriously at the hospital, she has been on his mind countless times. He leaves, hoping she has a sweet dream. Meanwhile, from a distance, a man remarks that he has not seen his brother's shadow walk in a while. The next day, Lisa got scolded a lot by her brothers. But to her shock, Len did praise her for the first time ever for doing well and saving the Duchess. Two days passed, and Dr. Sven and Graham, who were done with the investigation, revealed how Lisa's procedure was perfect. This shocks the Emperor. Dr. Sven continues that if it weren't for Lady Lisa, the Duchess would have died. He shows the Emperor how Lisa wrote down her intention and the procedure, knowing very well what she was doing. Dr. Sven requests the Emperor have the statement published as a medical paper. Even Graham agrees. The Emperor groans, knowing now that Lisa will be awarded at least a medal worth the Royal Rose insignia, and be known as Dame Elise. He knows he can't shut up everyone to sing praises of Lisa. Dr. Sven asks to meet Lisa in person. Even Graham is curious as to who this lady is, as she seems comparable to Lady Rose. The Emperor grants them permission. Meanwhile, Lisa is studying for the medical exam. She gets interrupted by Michael, Leonard's younger brother, as he whispers in her ear teasingly. He is excited to learn what expression his sister-in-law will make after seeing her fiancé's political opponent, but seeing her teary-eyed wasn't what he had expected at all. She calls him by his nickname, Mill, taking Michael back. The scene shifts to a flashback, where Michael is seen consoling a crying Lisa because of Leonard. Back in the present, Lisa maintains her composure and introduces herself. He is confused as to why someone whom he has met for the first time is looking at her with such longing and sadness in her eyes. He says he only came by to say hello, and he excuses himself. From that day on, he regularly came to greet Lisa. It turns out he was also confined in the tower because he stole the ceremonial wine for the birthday celebration. He has her drink with him and gets comfortable pretty quickly. Lisa notices how Mill hasn't changed at all. He was always carefree and cheerful and treated everyone with love. Michael, the third prince, was loved by the people and is the Empire's strongest knight, the Aura Knight. He was also Lisa's precious friend, but she couldn't prevent his death. The only way is for Mill to give up his right to the throne, but it won't be possible for one reason. The last words she heard from Mill were that he wanted to tell her something. She gets cut off from her thoughts as Michael asks what's wrong. He asks why she wants to be a doctor when she is already a noble. She explains that just as she likes sword fighting, she also likes treating people, as it brings her joy. And if she can't become a doctor, then her soul will wither away like a bird trapped in a cage. By night, Michael bids a sleeping Lisa farewell, saying he will leave the castle tomorrow and won't be seeing her for a while. Plus, he hopes his brother takes good care of her. The next day, Lisa is visited by Graham and Dr. Sven, who are shocked to learn that the genius who treated the Duchess is their Lady Rose who in reality is, in fact, Lady Elise. She apologizes for hiding her identity and properly introduces herself. Dr. Sven reveals she has been declared innocent and how she will become the first lady in history to acquire the Royal Rose insignia and become a dame. Later, even the Duke of Wales personally comes to thank Lisa. Days passed, and following Lisa's award ceremony came the day of the doctor's exam. She decides to trust herself and ace the paper. While growing up as an orphan on earth, she realized how blessed she was as Lisa. Even Michael has given her treats as good luck. As the paper starts, Lisa is shocked to learn the questions are exactly like the ones found in Korean and US licensing medical exams back on earth. She knew everyone must be baffled, as they seemed difficult at first glance. But Lisa was used to this type of exam. In the end, she grows nervous as most of the questions she answers are related to theories not yet developed in this world. Outside, Leonard disguised himself as Ron approached her, saying he had come to repay the favor. He asks how her exam went, and she dejectedly says it didn't go that well. This makes him wonder if she really hates the idea of marrying him that much. He tells her to come with him, as he will buy her whatever she wants. As they silently rode the carriage to Ray Cafe, Lisa couldn't help but feel oddly comfortable with him, as if she had known him for a long time. As she munches on the desserts, Leonard stares at her in wonderment. He decides to summon Chris to learn more about Lisa. They later go to see a play, and Leonard notices Lisa eyeing it. Lisa is doubtful and asks if she really wants to watch it, and he says he wants to watch it with her, causing her to blush. By the end of the day, Leonard was happy to spend time with Lisa. 
but he knows all of that belongs to Ron and not him. Soon, the scores of the doctor's exams are about, and to the Emperor's shock, the medical circle of the Empire is willing to welcome a new pioneer that surpasses even Count Braham. And the one who did it is none other than Dame Lisa de Clorence. But for the king, this isn't enough to satisfy their bet, as the condition is to accomplish something as a doctor that holds more value than being the prince's fiancé, and furthermore, the empress. Two months pass by, and Lisa is happy to fully give her time to treat people at the hospital. On the other hand, the emperor and the prince are concerned that the war with the Francoin Republic will only get bigger from now on. The emperor orders two knights to serve in the war from each noble family. Thinking of how Leonard also has to participate makes the Emperor sad as he remembers the Angeli War from two years ago. During that, the three princes joined the war to fulfill their duties as royals. The first royal prince was hit by a cannonball from the Republic and was killed. It was the second biggest tragedy after the royal tragedy 15 years ago. He knows that day must have deeply scarred Leonard, as his outstanding son lost all expressions after that day. Meanwhile, Lisa, along with Graham and the other doctors, figure out early signs of an epidemic among their patients. They begin to investigate the matter by collecting data from other hospitals in the Empire as well. When Lisa is finished with work, she finds Ron outside. He takes her away and reveals how he won't be able to see her anymore as he will be joining the second Krim expedition. She grows sad and is unable to say anything. He bids her farewell properly, telling her to take care of herself, and leaves while she hopes he stays safe. Though she has no relationship with Ron, she feels her heartache. She runs after him and gives him a pendant that belonged to her mother. It was an emblem given to loved ones to wish them a safe return from war. She leaves it in his care, telling him to be a coward if it means staying safe. He thanks her, promising to return the emblem safely to her. The reason Leonard did this was because he can't use his powers to disguise often, and now he can't use them for a full year. Returning home, Lisa learns that her brothers are going to war, making her cry in frustration as the past hasn't changed. Though Chris comes to console her, she pushes him away. The next day, she goes to the hospital, and Graham is shocked to see her puffy eyes. He reports to her that she was right, as there have been 79 deaths in Londo with similar symptoms. Lisa is now sure it's the second Londo epidemic, a tragedy that resulted in 10,000 casualties. She knows he needs to step up and save lives, ultimately winning the bet. But she is dejected, as it still won't keep Chris out of war. However, suddenly it clicks in her mind. She rushes to get an audience with the Emperor, and informs him how the contagious disease is cholera is spreading due to contaminated water. She requests full authority over the issue, promising to fix things within three days, and she makes him promise that this will close their bet with her as the winner. The emperor gives her his word and expresses how sad he is that she doesn't want to be the empress. But to his surprise, Lisa says she wants to marry the royal prince as arranged, even after she stops the epidemic. But in return for winning the bet, she presents two conditions and asks for a favor. The conditions are to postpone the engagement, and if the prince doesn't want to marry her, she wants the emperor to respect his wishes. As for the favor, she says she will discuss it after the epidemic is over but makes him promise to grant it if it doesn't harm the empire. Though she has now saved Chris, she is back to where she started. It's fine for her to give up her doctor's dream if it means saving her brother. She begins to weep, wanting to see Ron again. Her wish is somehow fulfilled as soon as she hears his voice. But when she turns back, she finds it wasn't Ron but the prince. He asks what made her cry, and she apologizes. He tells her to follow him as he hears from his father and will discuss the epidemic. Despite some minister's annoyance that a little girl will be ordering them around, Lisa is able to find the source of the contaminated field with Leonard's help. She tells the prince that she must go in person to do research, but he says he won't allow her to. She asks if he's worried she will get sick too, to which he sighs and decides to go with her to the areas of high risk. They head to the lower banks of the Tez River, and seeing the horrible stench and dirty river, Lisa could tell this is indeed the source of the cholera bacteria. She orders the shutting down of all public drinking pipes connected to this site, and asks for the removal of valves. Despite opposition from the health minister, Leonard orders it to be carried out. Plus, he assures Lisa that he trusts her. By the next day, the number of infected dropped below 100, shocking everyone. Graham is surprised that she really did stop the epidemic. Soon the word spread and people rejoiced in the dame's name. The emperor congratulates Lisa for her feat. Lisa then explains to him how future outbreaks can be prevented if the empire maintains its filtration system, 
proceeding with a large-scale operation for this cause. She then reminds the emperor of the promise he made her to grant her a favor. She then asks for his permission to join the second Krim expedition as a representative from her family instead of her brother Chris. The emperor and the prince were shocked. The emperor becomes furious at her, but Lisa knows she has no other option. Even the prince upsettingly approaches her. When Leonard refuses to let her join, Lisa reminds him they are not connected in any way, and his remarks aren't justified, especially since the emperor has already agreed to her request. He agrees and apologizes to her, taking his leave. Though he knows she's right, that fact hurts him as if a knife were digging into his chest. This is the first time after that day he wanted something. He has worked hard all these years to punish the perpetrators of that tragedy. All day, all he can do is worry about Lisa. In this moment, he realizes he has fallen for her and hopes she doesn't get hurt, vowing to protect her at all costs. Lisa breaks the news later to her family about how she will treat the patients on the battlefield. Her father is furious and tells her to get out of the house, saying she isn't his daughter anymore. Now that she has been kicked out, Lisa wonders where to go. She has also been barred from Teresa Hospital. As it starts raining, Yulian approaches her, volunteering to take her back to her place for tea. She has her sleep at her place for tonight too. But Lisa is unable to leave the next day either, as she is stuck with a heavy fever. Lisa is touched by Lady Yulian's care and soon begins to feel better. Later that day, Len comes to meet Lisa and trains her to protect herself on the battlefield. He teaches her to load and shoot a gun. But after several tries, she couldn't hit the target and gave up. Len explains that she must learn to shoot to save herself from impending danger, and if she feels at all sorry for her family, who's worried sick about her, then she should pick up that gun. Lisa realizes why he is pushing her. He's worried and wants to help her survive. She apologizes and continues training, determined to come back alive for her family. By sunset, she is finally able to shoot. Len leaves, telling Lisa to go home, apologize, and stay there until she leaves for war. Upon returning home, the Marquis embraces his daughter, telling her he loves her. He tells her to be careful and not even have a scratch hurt her. Time went by, and the Britia Empire's preparations for the second Krim expedition went smoothly. Chris protested to go too, but he was scolded, and he gave up eventually. It turns out, along with the war, Lisa's coming-of-age ceremony was also coming. The time for the expedition to leave finally arrives. With the Emperor and Leonard's speech, Lisa also gives her speech, promising to save as many people as she can, hoping they return to their families safe and well. The soldiers cheer for her, and to her surprise, Leonard grabs her hand, which she reads as a mere stunt for the onlookers. On the other hand, Michael meets his deranged mother before going to war. He vows to defeat the Republic and make her happy after becoming the Emperor. Meanwhile, Louis has gotten to know Lisa will be joining the Krim expedition and hopes to bring her back as a trophy if he wins the war. On the ship, Michael informs Lisa how they will soon be arriving at the royal family's St. Berg's Harbor. Once they get to the Romanov territory, they will move by foot. He offers to have her ride a horse with him if it's too difficult for her. From a distance, Leonard sees them happily chatting away and is jealous to see how Lisa is completely different from when she is with him. But the problem is, how can he get her more comfortable around him? When they reach the army hospital, Lisa is shocked to see the unsanitary and neglected conditions of the injured soldiers. At this rate, they will die together from being infected. She knows she has to change the system, and she finds the one in charge here. The drunk in charge introduces himself as Lieutenant Haynes, but Haynes has no intention to accept that he's wrong. Lisa heads to the Empire's army headquarters and speaks with the head of supplies. John agrees to talk to the superiors about it and asks her to leave rudely. She knows she needs to be listened to, she needs political authority. As she ponders, Leonard approaches her and asks what brings her here. Lisa greets him and contemplates discussing the matter with him. She eventually reveals the matter to him, and he leads her to his office to discuss things in detail. Leonard brews some tea for Lisa, shocking her. Plus, it tasted awful, so she didn't say a thing. Leonard senses her discomfort and realizes that the marshal, who advised him to do this, was wrong. They get to business, and Leonard asks how improving the hospital would benefit the army and how much the Empire should invest. Lisa ponders and answers that, with proper support, the expected benefit would be lowering the death rate of injured soldiers by tenfold. Hearing this takes him by surprise. But for that, Lisa explains they need a clean environment, proper waste management, and better medical supplies. Leonard estimates and realizes the backup Lisa is requesting doesn't require large-scale resources or manpower. He expresses his support for her suggestion but reveals that he cannot decide this himself. He suggests she participate in the Command's Council meeting two days from now and voice her concerns. She agrees and thanks him. 
he then asks for a favor in return for his help. Hesitatingly, he confesses that he would like to see her smile. Lisa is surprised, and Leonard reveals that she is always frowning lately, knowing she is able to smile in front of others. Lisa gives an awkward smile, but he tells her to do better. She eventually smiles, taking him aback. He approaches her and remarks, it's nice to see her smile. She leaves while Leonard thinks of how frustrating it is that he likes her so much. Later, Lisa couldn't help but think of the prince's words. Two days pass by, and the council meeting day arrives. After the essential issues are discussed, Leonard reveals how Dame Elise has another issue to discuss. She begins her speech and notices how unimpressed the militants are. But she soon gains their attention as she reveals how she can lower the current death rate by tenfold. She presents her research on the cases of deaths for wounded in the past four months, shocking others. Injury from battle only accounts for less than 2% of all casualties. No one objects to her suggestion, and Leonard assigns Lisa as a temporary medical commander to oversee the project. He gives her three months to accomplish her goal, as after that she will be acknowledged for her accomplishments and become the commander. If she fails, she will lose her right to be in this war and be forced to return home. With her research, Lisa gets to know Haynes has evidence of embezzlement against him. He is dismissed and ordered to be punished immediately, and Lisa becomes in charge of the hospital. Knowing she cannot bluntly ask the military to raise their budget, she writes a letter to her father for help. Days pass by, and people notice how clean the conditions are and how fewer cases of contagious diseases are there too. And it's all thanks to the lady with the lamp that everything has improved in such a short time. The mutterings of one soldier soon spread among the troops of the Empire. Those who recovered spoke of her when they returned to the battlefront, and many were touched by her deeds. Soon, her story spread even to Britia Island. And so, to support her, supplies from her family and donations from the people of the Empire were sent to the military hospital. Soon enough, Graham and the other doctors also joined Lisa, making her incredibly happy. Two months passed, and the Empire's troops advanced under the command of Prince Leonard. The war was waged back and forth between the two opponents, but thanks to Leonard's wise orders, the battle seemed to favor the Empire's side. Meanwhile, Lisa continued improving the army's conditions with everyone's help and support. And then, three months later, the report on Dame Lisa's project to lower the death rate was presented. Leonard is shocked to learn that the death rate fell 20-fold in just three months. Meanwhile, the Republican soldiers argue about how to turn the battle to their advantage. Louis eventually suggests hitting all three of the enemy's forces, an all-out attack called the Anvil Operation. Louis has purposely waited for three months to weaken the fort's defenses so the enemy would take it. And soon, he will be able to see the lady with the lamp. Meanwhile, Lisa is busy treating the injured at the military hospital. Since she hasn't seen Ron in here, she hopes he stays safe wherever he is. She gets cut off from her thoughts as Leonard approaches her. He hesitatingly gives her flowers and wishes her a happy birthday. He apologizes for not being able to celebrate it properly, but promises to do so after the war. She tells him it's alright and thanks him for the roses, as they are her favorite flower. Before leaving, Leonard tells her to visit the headquarters often and make sure to come by his office to make reports. He also informs her of the advisory council regarding the enemy's movements tomorrow. Lisa is shocked, as she has never received flowers from Leonard in the past. While visiting the headquarters the next day, she comes upon a casualty report file and asks John to look for the name Ron in it. She is relieved to learn he isn't on the list. John offers to help her find the person sincerely, and she agrees. Later, John informs Lisa that there is no Sir Ron on the current expedition, shocking her. This worries her, and she accidentally bumps into Yulian's brother. He helps her up and leaves, indifferently telling her to pay more attention. The meeting soon begins, and Leonard reveals how the enemy is preparing an all-out assault, calling it the Anvil Operation. This surprises Lisa, as in her past life, that was the enemy tactic that killed her brother, and even the Empire suffered a great deal of damage. But the soldiers and Leonard were at ease, as they had a greater number of skilled soldiers. Leonard orders him to divide them and send them all to each force. But Lisa knew it would be over if their troops were divided because that's exactly what Louis, the Scorpion, wanted. She gets worried, and even Leonard thinks Louis is going for such an obvious plan. Before he can ponder over it more, Lisa interjects. She voices her concern and reveals that rather than being an anvil operation, it is rather a chisel and hammer tactic. It turns out that Lisa was thinking the same thing as Leonard. Lisa goes on to explain that the chisel and hammer symbolize a focused attack rather than an overall attack, a force focused on one spot. In her opinion, Louis wants them to divide their soldiers at the central base and use them as a backup for each side. 
Simply put, he wants to weaken their central base by decreasing the number of troops, whereas the attacks headed to the east and west are a guise. But the generals find her assumptions ridiculous. Albert de Childa speaks up at this moment and says he partially agrees with Dame Lisa. Albert provides evidence for Lisa's claims. Lisa is shocked to see him help her, even though he's part of the aristocrats' party. Leonard concludes that 50,000 soldiers each will march from the central base to the east, and west, as that will be their guys. He explains that when the scorpion attacks the center, they will be their backup, hiding in the standby. He supports Lisa's opinion as well and thanks her. After the meeting is dismissed, Lisa approaches Albert and thanks him for helping her. Albert says he wasn't helping her but just had the same opinion. Albert then leaves, telling her that Yulian has sent her regards. She tells him to be careful in the field, and he tells her to be careful too. Later, Leonard is informed that the enemy is sending about 300,000 enemy soldiers to their center near Kofsk. The generals are surprised to learn that their dame was, in fact, right. Leonard knew they were prepared, and tonight they would celebrate in front of the head of the scorpion. Lisa assures Jay they will win, but deep down, she knows the outcome is unknown. If all their troops fall, the enemy will reach this place and take her hostage. She casts her thoughts aside and focuses on doing her best. She tells the other doctors to remember their job and mission, regardless of the outcome. The battle begins, and Louis is determined not to leave empty-handed. But to his utter shock, he learns that the Empire's troops that were headed to the east and west have come back to attack their flanks. His soldiers are unable to hold their formation any longer as the Master Swordsman pierces through it. Realizing they have seen through his strategy, Louis orders his soldiers to fall back and retreat. Suddenly, a bullet pierces through his eye. Afterward, the Republic's army crumbled under the full siege. The battle that began in the morning finally came to an end the following day. The Empire's army marched towards the central area and expanded its territory. Simferopol, the capital of the peninsula, was now under the influence of the Empire. And so, the tides of war favored the Empire once more. Five days later, a celebratory banquet was held, but Lisa politely refused to join as there were many patients in the hospital. When Leonard learns of this, he sighs, thinking of how bothersome it is to make Lisa take a break. Meanwhile, Lisa is surprised to learn the prince sent celebration food to the hospital, and for her since they were busy tending to the patients. Soon, Leonard joins them, and the doctors take their leave to give them space except for Graham. When the prince asks if he doesn't have the patience to look after, Graham grits his teeth in anger and leaves. Lisa also excuses herself, but he grabs her, telling her to stay unless she wants him to be alone. Now that he has made her stay, he wonders what to talk to her about to make her happy. Earlier, the marshal advised him to seize the opportunity to surprise the dame with his humor and eloquent way of talking. This was difficult for Leonard, as it wasn't who he was, unlike his younger brother who is natural at it. He decides to tell her the joke the marshal told him about the bird that flew away after a gunshot. At that moment, Leonard instinctively knew that telling the particular joke would end in disaster, and he rightly stopped himself. While he drowns in self-pity, there is a knock on the door. Michael enters, and he and Lisa exchange greetings while Leonard glares at him. Michael then asks Lisa if she can teach him how to be a surgeon. This shocks the other two. Michael reveals that there's a patient, but she can't do the operation, and he will have to do it. He points to the south of the liver, saying something is lodged there. He reveals that he can't bring the patient here, but if they don't do something, he will die. It turns out he is talking about Albert. Michael talks to her about this outside, revealing that the small bullet is a small rifle grenade. And if they brought him here, everyone would be in danger. Luckily, the grenade hasn't exploded, but it's lodged in his belly like a bullet. One wrong move and the grenade might explode during the operation. After pondering for a bit, she assertively volunteers to see the wound and then decides what to do. They headed to where Albert was. Lisa sees how he even lost his leg during the fight. Seeing the dame, the aristocrats' party members kneel, begging her to save Albert. The grenade was different from what Lisa had read in the papers. Michael explains that a scientist named Vanel modified their grenades so that they were smaller and easier to use, like bullets. But it has one critical flaw. At times, it can be unresponsive or extremely sensitive. Simply put, they are uncontrollable and unpredictable. Michael asks about the surgery procedure, after which she will go back. Lisa chuckles, explaining the whole procedure, rambling on and on, while Michael remains dumbfounded and confused. Knowing there is only one way to save Albert, she says she will do the operation. She explains that if she can cut the adrenal gland and the kidney that's near the wound without touching the grenade, no one will get hurt, 
and Albert will live. Determined, she assures Michael she can do it and thinks of the operation as a fiacromocytoma surgery, a rare tumor that develops in the adrenal gland with excessive secretion of hormones. She promises to stop midway if the operation seems impossible. But if she doesn't try, she reveals Albert will die. Michael agrees with one condition, and that is to assist her during the operation. To this, Lisa agrees. He promises to protect her in the worst-case scenario, even if he has to sacrifice himself. Lisa smiles and then orders Carmen to notify the hospital to prepare for surgery, and then tell everyone to evacuate the building. Before they can move Albert, Leonard appears from behind, angry that Lisa is going to do such a difficult operation. As Leonard becomes angrier, Michael attacks his neck to make him pass out for some time. Lisa decides to focus on the surgery for now and head to the hospital while Michael ponders begging for forgiveness so he won't be confined yet again for hitting his brother. The operation begins, and Lisa bravely splices open the abdominal cavity. Meanwhile, Michael watches her perform and realizes why his brother has fallen for her. While Michael lifts the liver, Lisa cuts the ligaments attached to it. Luckily, the grenade didn't hit the liver. Lisa focuses on stopping the bleeding and not coming in contact with the grenade. She then goes deeper in and ties the blood vessels with a thread. After that has been done successfully, Lisa ties the vessel above the kidney and removes the adrenal gland from the abdomen. Michael watches her perform and is amazed to see her handle such an operation so calmly. However, in the middle, Lisa abruptly drops the scalpel by mistake. Knowing that the grenade might explode is making her more nervous than she should be. She regains her composure and continues. Michael vows to protect her at all costs if something goes wrong. Finally, Lisa severed all connections. She notices how the grenade penetrates the gland and into the abdominal cavity membrane. There is now no way to remove this without touching the grenade, and she wonders what to do. Logically, it'd be better to stop here and stay safe, like she promised her family. But she recalls Albert's father's words to keep Albert safe as well as Julian. She knows it's dangerous, but not wanting to give up just yet, she continues performing the surgery. Suddenly, she comes into contact with the grenade. At this moment, she remembers her family and Ron, who makes her remember Leonard. Michael grabs her and pulls away, ready to protect her. But the explosion never came. He sighs, realizing it was an inactive grenade. Lisa cries in relief. Now that they know the grenade is inactive, there's no need to hold back, and they successfully finish the surgery. Amidst the operation, Michael suggests she travel with him. She chuckles, agreeing that it will be fun. They continue chatting away, and Michael tells her to call him Mill. Thankfully, no one got injured as they finished the surgery. Lisa informs Michael that Albert will now be sent back to the mainland as he can't fight. And Lisa knew that, due to his ankle injury, it would be difficult for Albert to remain the next heir of his house. They are then dragged away for disobeying a superior's orders, as the general tells them Leonard has woken up. Meanwhile, Louis has come up with another plan to get his revenge, despite the strategy being inhumane. Lisa was confined to an oddly luxurious room and was relayed the message that Leonard praised her for doing well. Lisa gets that he did that to have her get some rest. Three days pass by, and Lisa is regularly served her meals in the room. She wonders how the hospital is operating. Sir Carmen and Laos told her in secret that Albert was doing well now. Plus, she was curious as to why so many clothes in this room were of a nobleman. As she gets out of the bath, she suddenly hears the front door open, making her scream. Leonard tells her to calm down, as it's him. She asks what he is doing here, and he reveals that this is his room. He blushingly averts his eyes and tells her to get changed or she'll get a cold. She changes into her pajamas and asks why she was put on probation in this specific room. He says there weren't any rooms available, and since she is becoming a royal family member, he can't have her stay in just any room. She finds the reason justifiable and makes excuses to leave since he is back. But he grabs her, asking why she's leaving. He tells her to stay and rest. This makes Lisa wonder why he wants her to stay and whether it's because he wants her body. But she was certain the prince wasn't that kind of person. She sighs in relief as he asks her to rest. She begins to lie on the couch, but he tells her to come to bed as it will be uncomfortable. She protests, to which he asks if she dislikes being with him that much. She says no and says the bed is just small. He asks if she's worried that he will do something to her and says he won't touch her before they are married, telling her not to worry. Seeing that he has no choice, he approaches her and lifts her up. He then puts a flustered Lisa on the bed. He then apologized for getting upset at her before, when he thought she might get hurt and became worried. Lisa confesses she was so terrified when she thought she might die and even exhausted after the operation. But she felt a lot better after his message that she did well. She then wishes him good night and lies down. 
Lisa ponders how much different the prince is compared to the one she knew in her past life. She casts her thoughts aside and focuses on sleep. A while later, Leonard calls out to her, but seeing she isn't responding, he figures she's asleep. He supposes she doesn't see him as a man. He was going to leave after checking on her like always, but when he saw her, he couldn't stop himself from being with her. Even for a short moment, just like this, he wanted to be with her. As long as she looks at him and smiles at him, he is willing to give up everything for her. He pushes his thoughts aside as Lisa begins squirming in her sleep. It seems to him as if she is having a nightmare. She mumbles in her sleep for help, saying she doesn't want to die, making him wonder if it was the same dream as before. He hopes not to see her suffer, even in her dreams and embraces her. Meanwhile, Louis is satisfied to have finally launched his revenge plan. The next day, Lisa contemplates her feelings for the prince as well as the prince's towards her. A day later, Michael visits her and reveals he has caught a cold. After a proper examination, it turns out that Michael has a high fever. This surprises them both since aura nights are supposed to be healthier as compared to normal nights. She leaves him in Jay's care, but a while later, Lisa learns that Jay has caught the fever too. This makes her feel as if she's missing something important. As she is busy finding out the cause of Jay's sudden worsening health, the doctors inform Lisa that suddenly more patients vomiting blood are coming in. This makes her wonder if it's a contagious hemorrhagic fever. She wonders where the disease came from and what it is. The soul virus and yellow fever are all hemorrhagic fevers. She begins gathering more evidence. But the next day, two of the three new patients died after a sudden spike in their fevers. Moreover, ten more patients suffering from hemorrhages arrived right after. Of the ten that arrived, three died and two fell ill. The next day, twenty new patients came in. The generals remain patient, hoping their lady with the lamp will solve the matter quickly. Even Louis was amused and waited to see what Lisa would do now. Leah talks to Leonard about it, revealing she does have a partial solution for this epidemic. She explains how the number of deaths will increase with this number, but they will be able to prevent an even worse case scenario. For that, they need help and a small sacrifice. She asks him to grant her absolute authority over commanding soldiers regardless of their rank, saying the soldiers must be isolated on the basis of an epidemiological survey. The disease seems to spread through contact with bodily fluids. He is certain her plan of isolating the soldiers will be effective, and he agrees with her. They also find the Republic suspicious of spreading the epidemic among them. She then reveals that the small sacrifice must come from the medical staff, as they must be the ones to treat the patients in isolation. But since it's dangerous, she reveals her plans to accept only volunteers. And to reduce the risk of infection, she suggests creating protective attire. He firmly refuses to let her go to the isolation rooms, but she says his subjective remarks make her feel uncomfortable, especially since this is her duty. He is hurt and agrees to support her, but asks her to promise not to get hurt. She doesn't say anything and leaves, while Leonard prays to God to keep Lisa safe. After isolating all the patients in their respective orders, Lisa begins to prepare to treat them. She suggests saving the patients through oxygen therapy, as their lungs are being filled with blood and, due to a lack of oxygen, they are dying. She explains that they can provide them with highly concentrated oxygen to treat hypoxia even when the lungs are filled with blood. She suggests providing oxygen with a portable hyperbaric chamber, which is an oxygen-concentrated chamber transported in a carriage or train. She knows there are 10 portable hyperbaric chambers in the West. The one in Bridia will take too long to transport across the sea, so they have to find one nearby. She wonders whether the Dukedom of Proushen will lend them theirs, as they are the closest. Later, House Childa gifts Lisa a portable hyperbaric chamber as a thank you for saving Albert. And so, Lisa is successfully able to drop the death rate from 70% to 10%. Even Michael got better. The word spread in the Empire too, where the Emperor decided to bestow Lisa the Medal of Honor after the Krim expedition. But her father only wishes for her to return home safely. Now the only problem left to handle for Lisa is how this disease suddenly occurred on the Krim Peninsula and among the Empire's army. After inquiring about soldiers, she is told that while imprisoned by Republicans, they were aided by Morian servants from the Dark Lands, where the diseases first spread. They were then released during a hostage exchange on purpose. And so, all this doing was of the Scorpion of the Desert. After Lisa informs Michael of this, he tells everything to Leonard, and they know this is enough to accuse the Republic. Leonard knows if they announce this through the news, the issue will become international 
and the Republic and Louis will lose their support within the peninsula. To gain more evidence, Michael heads out to retrieve the Morian servants' dead bodies for autopsy. To his surprise, Leonard also wishes for Michael to be careful. Leonard asserts he doesn't hate him, but Michael makes him remember they are enemies and one has to die. Leonard vows to give Michael the whole Romanov territory if he steps away from their feud over the throne. This shocks Michael. He asks if Leonard will abandon his plan too, to which he says he can't. Michael knows his brother can't give up his plan, but he can't give up his either. This fight is no one's fault, and they are simply fighting for themselves. The word soon spread about the inhumane strategy the Republicans' army applied, and they protested for Louis to return from war and be put on trial for violating the law of war. Louis becomes more agitated and curses at Lisa. He thinks of another plan to capture her and make her beg for her death very soon. Meanwhile, Leonard grows more troubled as Lisa keeps avoiding seeing him. She couldn't come up with a solution for her feelings towards him and, hence, avoided him altogether. She is approached by Len and asks him how he solves something when he can't. He advises her on how to face her problems head-on and avoid running away. He then leaves, telling her to keep her gun with her at all costs and be alert. But he hopes she never has to sue it because if she does, that means she is in the worst possible situation. Meanwhile, Louis orders preparations to be made, as their target now will be the field hospital in Prague. A messenger is sent to die by Louis towards Leonard's army. They eventually shot him down, as he wouldn't stop. Not wanting to die, the messenger swallows the letter and is shot down. They retrieve the letter nonetheless and send it to the prince. The letter was for General Leo, informing him how the Empire's 3rd Brigade was approaching Vorad as planned. They will proceed with the joint operation from both sides, as discussed. Since Lisa was busy, Louis decided to send the soldiers to the targeted sides from the headquarters. Meanwhile, Lisa decides to talk face to face with Leonard. However, Leonard and the soldiers have already made preparations to leave. Reaching there, Leonard gets to know the enemy army isn't there as expected. He realizes they have been tricked, and their actual target must be the unprotected Pravu, where Lisa is. He orders his army to hurry back, hoping Lisa will be safe. Meanwhile, in Pravu, cannon sounds are heard. A knight reveals to Lisa that the Republics are coming to attack the hospital, and she must leave. Knowing she will be captured anyway, she decides to do what only she can do. Republics soon eliminated the enemy's defenses, and Louis personally made his way to the hospital. After praising her fellow doctors and ordering them not to leave the conference room no matter what, she makes her way downstairs, ready to risk it all. When face to face with Louis, she offers a negotiation with him. In exchange for ensuring the safety and survival of the patients and medical staff in the hospital, she made him offer his life. But Louis isn't shaken in the slightest. He has his knights look at Lisa's legs, trembling, and says that she can't shoot. Snickers fill the room as they don't take Lisa's threats seriously. She finally pulls the trigger and shoots Louis Hand, who screams in pain. Before his commanders can take action, she asks them not to move, or she will shoot his head. She makes Louis swear in his nation's name not to lay a finger on anyone in the hospital. Lisa lowers the gun, and the knights quickly tackle her, ready to hurry back to their base before the enemy army can arrive. Leonard is too late, and he knows he can't go straight to the enemy's base as it will risk his and Lisa's lives. Meanwhile, at Simferopol, Colonel Fabian treats Lisa with respect since she saved his subordinate's life, who was taken as a prisoner. But Fabian knows that once the commander recovers, things for Lisa will become difficult, and he hopes for someone to rescue her. On the other hand, Michael overhears Leonard saying he will give up his position as commander to him while he charges into Simferopol himself. Michael interjects and argues with him over who should go save Lisa. Leonard pissed, uses the same technique Michael used on him before to make him collapse, and he has him go to jail. On the other hand, Louis is furious to learn that his hand has to be amputated as the bullet pierces through an artery. Frustrated, he drinks and goes to meet Lisa. Fabian stops him with all his might and before he can get himself killed by Louis, Lisa interjects. Louis grabs her, deciding to put a scar on her pretty face. But he gets interrupted as Leonard approaches him, telling him to take his hands off her. Lisa shoves Louis away and rushes to hug Leonard. He then angrily wounds Louis. As more soldiers gather, Leonard grabs Lisa, leaps out of a window, and flies away using his abilities. He rides a horse with Lisa, and Leonard tries escaping before his abilities can reach a limit. However, they are soon stopped by the Republic's elite unit commander, Hugo, and Leonard knows it will be impossible to escape from him. With Lisa's gunshot, they are able to escape successfully. As they gallop away, Louis chuckles, finding her lovely in such a situation. Leonard uses his abilities to destroy the gates, and they hurry away. 
Lisa grows concerned as Leonard coughs up blood as a side effect of his powers. He teases her for being worried about him. They decide to move south, as fewer Republican soldiers are assigned there, and from there to the Ukra Mountains. There, they seek refuge in a cave as Leonard's condition worsens. Lisa diagnoses it as hypothermia. She is confused as his temperature is low despite the fast pulse. She thinks it might have something to do with his power, which is an uncharted territory where science still can't be applied. She tries her best to relieve the inflammation and warm his body. She is touched to find out that he has medications for her in his bag since she gets sick often. She has him take an inflammatory drug. Before dozing off, he assures her he will be fine, get better soon, and protect her. Wanting to keep him warm as much as possible, she embraces his body. She notices him wearing a necklace and takes it out, only to find it's the emblem she gave to Ron when parting. This makes her realize he must have approached her as Ron, all because she didn't like him. But she wonders what the real reason is, hoping he will tell her everything once they return safely to Londo. Meanwhile, at Pravu's headquarters, the knights protest to go to battle to save their dame, but the commander tells them to be patient. Moreover, he learns that Michael has fled the prison, leaving an official resignation note for him. Reports suggest he is now going southwest towards the Ukra Mountains to rescue his idiot brother and the pretty lady. Meanwhile, Leonard becomes better. Lisa firmly tells him not to act recklessly and to come save her again as he is the future emperor. He acknowledges his role but says that to him, his title, the Britia Empire, and his life are not as important as hers. Flushed, Lisa averts her gaze and suggests leaving. It turns out the prince had brought food, warm clothing, a detailed map, and a compass, knowing they would have to go through the Ukra Mountains from the beginning. Before they can leave for the journey ahead, Leonard notices how pale Lisa looks, and his doubts are confirmed as he checks her fever. He has her rest in the cave, and he embraces her throughout the night to keep her warm. But her condition doesn't get better the next day either, despite her protests that she's fine. He tells her lying is a bad habit and assures her to rest for another day, as no enemy troops are nearby. As he takes care of her, Lisa smiles happily, enjoying the moment. To make things worse for the Republic Army, the enemy's naval army reaches the shore, ready to fight. The captain orders gun ports to be opened at the enemy, but the Empire's naval forces quickly overpower them. As per the prince's orders, the third naval fleet is ordered to end the war with their own hands. Meanwhile, Michael is lost in the Ukra Mountains, trying to find his brother and Lisa. Two days, during which Lisa and Leonard bond successfully. On the second day, Leonard sees Nicholas appearing nearer to the tracking team. He then decides to quicken their pace. But soon they are found, and despite Leonard's weakness, he tries his best to protect Lisa from the attacks. On the other hand, Len led some troops despite standby orders from the marshal to save the prince and Lisa. He firmly acknowledged taking full responsibility for disobeying orders and led them away, hoping his dear sister remained safe. On the other hand, Leonard sacrifices himself to make Lisa run away. But Lisa, seeing a gun being targeted at him, shields Leonard from it. As she grows unconscious from the pain, Leonard carries her to safety. However, they get surrounded by Louis and his troops. But before they can be killed, Michael finally comes to their rescue. He asks Leonard to flee in the other direction. He then injures Louis with his powers and fights off the other troops. Meanwhile, Fabian helps Leonard take Lisa away on his horse while diverting his troops' attention. Before Leonard can lose consciousness, he finally reaches Len and his men. Lisa is hurried to the hospital, and Graham volunteers to operate, while Leonard also pleads with him to save her. Though the operation is done successfully, Leonard learns that Lisa has a chance of dying due to excessive blood loss. Plus, there are fewer blood supplies, but Graham announces that there is a way. He leads Leonard inside and reveals how they could perform a blood transfusion, explaining it to be a method used to supply one with blood from someone else. And though there's a high chance of rejection, Lisa already provided a solution for it by mixing the two blood samples in a tube beforehand. However, Graham reveals that the problem is that they can't find any blood that matches the dames. Leonard asks why they aren't testing his blood, and the doctor reveals he isn't in a condition to donate it. Nonetheless, she orders them to test his blood, hoping a miracle occurs and their blood matches. To everyone's surprise, the blood matches, and the transfusion is completed, after which Leonard loses consciousness. Later, Michael is finally able to return. And though a great reward is promised for his deed, he is ordered to be put in jail again for breaking out. Meanwhile, the Third Fleet commences its operations, taking over all strategic points south of Simferopol. Soon, Leonard regains consciousness and approaches Lisa. He recalls how, before fainting, she wanted to tell him something and wondered what it was. Suddenly, Lisa wakes up and calls for him. 
She reveals how she had a long nightmare, but it's okay now. He tells her to sleep tight, assuring her she won't have any more nightmares. Later, Lisa's family comes to take her away to Londo, and Leonard lets them, but he is sad to know he can't hear what she has to tell him. Time passed by, and thanks to the royal prince's strategy, the empire took most of the strategic points in the Krim Peninsula except for the capital. The Republic was isolated without a supply line and was thus unable to continue the war when summer came. Soon, autumn arrived. The Republic's president suggested a peace settlement, and the Krim War finally came to an end. After losing the war, the president's reputation began to fall in the Republic. Time passed, and Lisa spent her time with her brothers and Yulian. She was soon offered the lead professor role at the Royal Cross Hospital, and she became the court medical consultant too. She recalls how the emperor told him how Leonard wanted to gift her a present, and she wonders what it might be. She is told by Yulian that the prince will be returning soon, making her blush. Before, Leonard used to come into her nightmares with him executing her, but now he smiles at her warmly in her dreams. She hopes to see him soon. She writes her usual letters to Lan and Michael. But as habitual, she is unable to write to the prince. She decides to send a present instead of a letter. But seeing the sweater she made for the prince makes her think otherwise. She gets interrupted, and she is summoned by the emperor, who presents her with the gift he has been talking about. The law not allowing the empress to hold a side job was revised on the condition that it didn't clash with her duties within the palace. This makes her tear up, and she exclaims how this gift is more valuable than any jewel in the world. After she leaves, the emperor apologizes to his wife for not being able to avoid the impending tragedy that is to happen between Leonard and Michael. Meanwhile, Leonard is pissed to learn that both Len and Michael are receiving letters from Lisa and not him. He uses his authority to read their letters. On the other hand, Lisa goes out to select dresses for herself with Marie, learning of Leonard's return. She is also asked by a noble to treat his cardiac cancer of the stomach. She knew he was hostile to her, but since the hospitals refused to treat him, he asked for her. But since her schedule was busy, she decided to operate the morning Leonard arrived and then hurry to meet him. On the other hand, Graham has no choice but to watch the couple from afar. The day for Leonard to return to Londo finally arrived. On the other hand, Lisa hurriedly does the operation, but before she can leave to get ready to greet the prince, warm arms embrace her from behind. It was Leonard whom she has truly missed. She suggests brewing him some tea which leads her to her messy office. There, Leonard notices the knitted sweater, and, in an attempt to hide it, Lisa knocks off the pile of letters she never sent to Leonard. Leonard reads them and blushes to realize she has actually been attempting to write him letters, but was too shy to send them. They get interrupted as Chris enters, introducing himself as Leonard's personal secretary. He then informs him how the Emperor is looking for him since he ignored protocol and came straight here. They part ways, and Leonard remains busy for a few days, unable to see Lisa. Lisa even comes to see him but is told he is in a council meeting. She leaves the brewing tea recipe for a staff member. Leonard later learns that Lisa came to see him and makes an unofficial visit to House Clarence. He finds Lisa outside and embraces her, revealing he wants to see her. He asks why she wanted to see him earlier, and she eventually reveals how she missed him. Their moment gets interrupted once again by Chris and Len, who take their sister back inside. However, a while later, Lisa comes back and gives him warm clothes since it has begun to snow. He kisses her on the head and tells her to visit the palace as much as she can. Meanwhile, at Childa's place, the aristocrats and Michael hold a meeting to discuss the biggest threat to the second prince's rule, Lisa. Thanks to her, support for Leonard has increased greatly which wasn't present in the past. Michael explains how, if Leonard becomes the emperor, the people likely to die will be his mother, his uncle Amschel de Childa, and he himself. Though Michael knows his brother's revenge is fair, he can't simply watch them die. After dismissing the meeting, Michael warns the Count not to dare touch Lisa, knowing he loves her. In the past, Empress Regent Rebecca and her daughter were disgracefully framed and confined in the Bloody Tower. No one thought she was at fault, but there was clear evidence against her, and she could not escape the false accusations. This was done by the Michael's mother and uncle as the Emperor favored Leonard's wife and according to his uncle, his sister suffered a great deal. Since the Emperor was newly crowned, he did not have the power to save them and told them to wait. But Rebecca couldn't take it any longer and committed suicide along with her daughter while Leonard witnessed this tragedy live. Leonard wakes up from the nightmare and recalls spending last night with Lisa. He informs Randall that he is heading out to the Royal Cross Hospital. On the other hand, Graham checks Lisa's pulse since it seems she caught a fever. But Leonard sees them and turns annoyed. He sees Lisa and realizes she is unwell. He rushes to her, and Graham explains how he was examining the dame since she seems to have caught a cold. 
He and Graham convince her to get some rest while Graham volunteers to take over her operations. Leonard has her sit in his office so she won't run off to work. He orders a warm blanket and drinks for her, and she says she wants hot cocoa. He then tells her to lie down, but she says there's not a pillow. Leonard rushes to her, and it is beside her. He then pulls her down to his lap, making her blush. Leonard is also later embarrassed by his actions. She settles, and Leonard caresses her hair, confessing he loves her. He further confesses how he wants to see her in the morning when he wakes up, eat every meal every day with her, and have tea together. He wants to eat delicious desserts with her, walk the streets while holding her hand, and watch interesting performances too. All of it, with her. Lisa begins to cry joyfully, saying she also wants the same, to be happy with him forever. The day of the expedition's celebration ceremony arrives. Both Len and Lisa are to be awarded with the Royal Cross insignia. Michael was also acknowledged as being fourth in accomplishments and was awarded the Royal insignia. The Emperor greets him and suggests that he have tea with him. The third was Lisa. She was also granted the title of Viscountess and given the Cromer region as her fief. As the cheers ensued around her and the prince, she finally confessed her love for him, and they kissed. After the grand ceremony, spring came to Londo. As Lisa becomes busy with court duties too, Leonard becomes annoyed as he can hardly meet her. Using his chest pain as an excuse, he meets her and seizes the opportunity to kiss her. As she leaves, Chris informs Leonard how the investigation has been completed to find a way to destroy the aristocrats. On her way out, Lisa bumps into Yulian and her father, who reveal they are here to see Marion. Lisa recalls Leonard's plan to take revenge on Michael's mother. But in the end, that revenge resulted in another tragedy that led to the deaths of Michael, Yulian, and many other aristocrats, ultimately covering Londo in blood. That's when the prince turned brutally cold toward her. The looming political battle between the prince and the aristocrats makes her anxious. While Lisa goes to check on the emperor, Leonard holds a meeting with the doctors, assigning them tasks and ordering them to take on Lisa's duties for the next few days. She takes a walk with the emperor, whose health has now worsened. The emperor asks if she has ever done something in her life that she regrets very much. He confesses he has and is punished for it. Even if God is generous, he wonders if God can forgive someone like him. Lisa assures him he will be forgiven, as nobody is free from making mistakes, be they large or small. Though committing the crime isn't justifiable, she pleads with him to stop suffering from it now. This makes him chuckle, and he hopes not to lose his strength before the joyous day. Lisa gets confused and asks what he means. The Emperor tells her Leonard will tell her soon. When she goes outside, she finds Leonard waiting for her. He suggests going to lunch. Lisa dozes off, and when she wakes up, she realizes they are out of Londo. She is shocked and fusses about working. Leonard hugs her, telling her to stop thinking about work as he has ordered the doctors to finish her tasks. They walk through the streets all day, and by sunset, Leonard takes her to the tallest tower, where Lisa enjoys the pretty view. By night, Lisa has exhausted herself. Leonard decided to let her rest tonight, as he planned to have a famous chef prepare breakfast for her tomorrow with Randall's assistance. Since Lisa wasn't waking up, he lifted her up and walked to Keen's. The sudden shift wakes her up, and she is surprised to learn they aren't returning home anytime soon. He assures her that her family has been notified, making Lisa shy, as she will have to sleep with Leonard here. That too in a sweet room. And since it's the Keen City Festival tomorrow, all the rooms were booked. She decides to trust the prince and agrees to share the room with him. While Lisa goes away to take a bath, Leonard composes himself by counting sheep. Soon they both are done bathing, and an awkward silence between them ensues as their hearts beat louder. Since there was only one bed, Lisa suggested sleeping together, saying they should trust each other. But he mentally warns Lisa not to trust him. While Lisa falls asleep, Leonard continues counting sheep. Suddenly, Lisa turns to him and cuddles up to him. He is relieved to see she doesn't have nightmares anymore and wishes her a good night. The next day, Leonard and Lisa wake up and have breakfast. He reveals to her how they will enjoy today together and leave for somewhere else the next day. As they walk through the festival stalls, Leonard explains that the festival is enjoyed early in the afternoon, and then the tomato festival begins late in the evening. They have fun the whole day and even dance together, making Lisa wonder if she will be able to live on even when this happiness is gone. After the tomato fest, they wash up, and Lisa suggests drinking together. They chat the night away, and soon Lisa begins to feel drunk. She leans on him, asking if he thinks they are fated. She says even their blood matches and types are the same, making it seem like they are fated to be together. Leonard agrees, making her smile. As he lifts her to shift her to bed, she kisses him in a drunken state. But as he begins kissing her neck passionately, he hears her snoring. She is now asleep, leaving a dejected Leonard all alone. 
The next day, Lisa notices how Leonard is sulking, but he shrugs it off as nothing. He informs her they are heading to Claywood City, but Lisa has never heard of the place. Leonard explains how it's a small, ordinary town on the west coast. They walk through the town for a while upon arrival and settle on a bench. Lisa is amazed by the ocean view. At that moment, Leonard asks Lisa to marry him, which she tearfully accepts. Though Leonard wanted to skip the engagement and marry her straight away, the minister told him off for it as it wasn't possible. Late that night, he visits his mother and sister's graves, telling them about how he is going to marry a woman he really loves. He then informs them that it won't be long until he has avenged them, telling them to wait a bit more. They soon return to Londo and get back to their daily routines. But Lisa knew this peace wouldn't last forever. Soon, the tragedy of Londo, a clash between the aristocrats and imperialists over the throne will arise. In the past, Leonard was successful in taking his revenge, and many aristocrats were killed. Afterward, he lost his mind as well, bringing him more pain and suffering. He felt guilty for killing his own brother and ashamed for shedding the blood of so many people. She wants to stop him, but she doesn't know how. Whatever choice he makes, Lisa knows it's not something an outsider should interfere with. One day, a fight broke out between Count Merkiot of the aristocratic party and Count Dorison of the imperialist party. Both end up wounding each other and being brought to the hospital to be treated by Lisa, as both are in a critical state. Seeing their conditions, Lisa reveals that the problem is that both need to undergo surgery right now. Chaos surrounds Lisa as some ask her to save one while others ask her to save the other. Leonard and Michael have the others get away from Lisa, which makes them leave. Even Leonard and Michael leave to prevent pressuring her. Lisa ponders and finally decides to save both at the same time by opening two operation rooms. She decided to operate on Count Mechie at first, as his condition is more critical while telling Graham to proceed with damage control surgery. They soon be in. Meanwhile, Leonard and Michael take a walk together, mutually agreeing that Lisa will do her best. She eventually succeeds in saving both the noblemen, earning the praise of the whole empire as well as her fiancé. During a meeting with Leonard, the emperor collapses due to low blood pressure. Lisa is called, and she brings him to the hospital for a diagnosis. Later, she meets Leonard, who is clearly trying to hide his sadness. She hugs him from behind, confessing how they should be together when times are tough. He embraces her back, happy to have her by his side. At this moment, Lisa decides she cannot see Leonard go through such pain and chooses to prevent the forthcoming tragedy, no matter what. The engagement preparations soon began and Lisa's father felt annoyed about having to let his daughter go. With the upcoming engagement ceremony, Michael seeks diversion with his newfound pet dog, whom he named Lisa. On the other hand, Graham drinks in sadness before the engagement day, wishing Lisa his love and happiness. The engagement day arrives, and Marie is in awe to see her mistress all dressed up for the occasion. Leonard approaches her and praises her, saying she looks so pretty that he wants to marry her right now. Marie then informs Lisa that His Majesty is here to see her. They exchange greetings, and Lisa's worry increases over his worsening health. Soon enough, the ceremony commences. After long prying, the Emperor is called in front to drink as a sign of celebration. But soon he pits out blood and collapses. Lisa comes to his aid and has him transported to the Royal Cross Hospital, while Leonard is in complete shock. He is confined in the Bloody Tower as a suspect for poisoning the Emperor. His reputation hits harder as Michael's uncle spreads the gossip across Londo. Soon, the aristocrats request an emergency council meeting to discuss the attempted poisoning of the emperor. Since Michael is now in charge, he releases the verdict that Leonard won't be accused without evidence. But if they don't find him, he will have to take responsibility. On the other hand, Lisa becomes frustrated as she is unable to decipher what illness the emperor has. Graham advises Lisa to rest, as she hasn't slept for two days while taking care of the emperor, and and suggests she meet Leonard. They tearfully exchange greetings, but Lisa is soon called back to the hospital as the Emperor goes into another shock. Knowing there is nothing left to try and save him, something clicks in Lisa's mind. There might be a possibility for the Emperor to have a pulmonary embolism. She seeks Leonard's permission and prepares for surgery after he approves. She severs the sternum in the central part of the chest to access the right heart chamber and pulmonary artery using a metal knife perfectly. She eventually finds the pulmonary embolism in one of the blood vessels and takes out what is blocking the artery. They begin to wrap things up, but suddenly Lisa notices a lump. It looks similar to a lymphoid mass to her, and she wonders if this is the cause of the emperor's illness. All his symptoms can indeed be explained by lymphoma, which can be treated using the medicine developed by Fleming. She is certain that, with some time, the emperor will be well again and smile at her and Leonard once again. 
as a reward. Leonard grants Lisa the title of Countess, which she is surprised to receive since she is just 18. As for Leonard, he has now taken over the Emperor's duties. As for Michael, Lisa sees him come to the Emperor's room every night to check on him, making her empathize with how distressed he must be feeling. Leonard gifts Lisa the Royal Cross, which grants the owner absolute immunity. They will then be forgiven by the Emperor for any sin for one generation. This cross has been bestowed only ten times in the history of the Britia Empire, overwhelming Lisa, but she accepts it. Time passed by, and Leonard began applying his strategy to ultimately destroy the aristocrats. He even introduces paper money to reduce House Childa's influence in the financial market. On the other hand, Yulian's father grows ill and is given ten days to live. He urges Michael to go with the plan to behead Prince Leonard. Wanting to stop the tragedy, Lisa decided to use the method she had thought of. She asks Leonard if he will punish her for doing something against him. He says it doesn't matter what she does, as if he can never hate her. She goes to meet Michael but is informed he is out. While waiting for him with his dog, she eavesdrops on the assassination plan of the crown prince. They notice her listening and capture her, deciding to go with the assassination earlier than planned or they will get in trouble. However, Michael soon appears and tells them to let go of Lisa. While she's unconscious, he confesses his love for her and reveals how he doesn't know how he will be able to kiss his brother. He sets off, but soon Lisa catches up to him and wipes his tears away. She then tells him how she has a plan. She then requests an audience with Leonard and asks if he can't let them live. Leonard says she doesn't know what she's talking about and refuses her suggestion, telling her to take care and go back. Lisa knew she had crossed a line. Even now, Leonard is holding back his fury because he has feelings for her. To save him from ruin, she speaks again. She says she knows what happened. He tells her not to say anything, as she doesn't know how his mother and sister haunt his dreams, and he tells her to leave. She suggests he find a way other than revenge. But he refuses to listen to her further and Lisa excuses herself. He has already sent information to Count Gilbert. Once the aristocrats try to ambush him on the outskirts of Londo, his revenge will begin. Lisa decides to create just a window of opportunity and leave the rest to them. She gets cut off from her thoughts as a crying Yulian hugs her, revealing how her father is going to die. Lisa rushes to him, knowing everything will end if the Marquis dies. She recognizes the symptoms as skeptic shock. If he isn't operated on immediately, he will die. Everyone looks up to the dame to save him, despite their hostility towards her. Lisa researches his condition and says he can be saved, but the operation is a high risk. Yulian grants her permission, and she begins the surgery after calling for Graham. After hours of operation, the surgery finally ended successfully. After the Marquess expresses his gratitude, Lisa takes the opportunity to ask him to reconsider the feelings of both Michael and Leonard about the tragedy. He ponders about it later and asks for his daughter's opinion. She reveals that, though her aunt suffered a great deal, he and her aunt were in the wrong. It is because having a reason doesn't justify a wrongdoing. After some ponderment, the Marquess hurriedly makes his way to the Palace of White, where the Empress was confined for six months due to him and his sister. He goes up to see the tower, where he comes face to face with an angry Leonard. To Leonard's surprise, the Marquis sincerely apologizes to him, but he thinks of it as him making fun of him. He tells him to pay the price that he sees fit to be forgiven. He then walks away but halts as he hears a crashing sound. It turns out that the Marquis fell to his death, and his face was strangely peaceful. Driven by confusion, Leonard later picks up a sword to kill Marion, but is stopped by Lisa. Leonard tears up, asking what he should do to forgive them. He retracts the orders he gave to Chris to gather all the aristocrats and asks for some time to think. He decides to have a private meeting with Michael and then hold a meeting with the aristocrats. With Michael, he offers him to leave with his mother from Britia and never return. Later in the banquet, he presents the aristocrats' crimes in front of them. To their surprise, he offers them a single chance to abandon everything from the past and pledge their allegiance to him, swearing upon their lives. But he cancels out some of the names as their sins are too grave to forgive. They were instead relegated to commoner status, and so they ultimately swear allegiance to the prince. Time passed, and many things happened. One of them was Leonard's coronation, and he was announced as Britia Empire's 12th emperor. Leonard's bloody fate was now different from the past Lisa had witnessed. Before Michael can leave, Lisa comes to bid him farewell. Michael reveals he might head towards Austrian, as the landscapes are beautiful and will hopefully get his mother better. He then says he will take the Silk Road to Kim. Soon, to their surprise, Leonard joins them and bids his brother farewell, much to Michael's happiness. He even offers him to come to the Empire after a while and have a drink with him. 
On the other hand, Yulian donates her family's entire fortune for the late Marquis crimes and changes the aristocrats' party name to Lamp Party after being inspired by Lisa. She also finally accepts Chris' proposal to go on a date with him. Things also spark up between Lady J and Graham. Meanwhile, Lisa and Leonard decide to visit the ocean. Lisa has come to notice how Leonard has changed and softened up a little bit. He seems to be at peace as if he's put down the heavy weight that he had to bear. It was indeed true. As for Lisa, she is grateful to have no regrets in this life. The day of their wedding soon approaches. The Marquis tearfully walks his daughter to the aisle. Then, Leonard and Lisa exchange their wedding vows. They kiss while cheers from the crowd follow. The scene shifts to Song Hyajin being forcefully woken up by her roommate before they can miss their flight. Her roommate scolds her for studying right up until morning. She guesses that in anticipation of visiting the Clarence estate, she was reading the book written by Lisa de Romanoff, who is often praised as the mother of modern medicine. Even though it was written over 150 years ago, it only needs a few tweaks to compensate for the advancement of technology. Even now, there isn't much room for revision. To Hyogen, it truly is an amazing accomplishment. Reading the author's biography was what fueled Hyogen's dream to become a doctor. And now she has finally had the opportunity to see Clarence Estate in person. They visit the oldest bakery in town and decide to see the estate tomorrow. At night, they discuss how the person Hyogen is meeting tomorrow seems totally devoted to his wife. Her roommate has noticed a bunch of phrases around the place, for my Lisa. The next morning, Hyogen goes to the estate and is told about the history of the renowned doctor. She finds her portrait with her husband and reads the list of her achievements. She gets interrupted by another man's arrival, who seems oddly familiar to him. They get to talking while she remains unable to read the last of Lisa's great achievements, being Leonard's beloved wife. And with this, the manwa ends. Let us know what you think of the story in the comments section.